Chapter 19 of A Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Murder of Mr. Drummond, Rebecca and Her Daughters, Spread of the Movement Through Wales, Its End, Rebecca Dramatized, Rebecca in London the year opened badly with the assassination of edward drummond esq the private secretary of sir robert peel walking quietly down parliament street he was suddenly fired at by a man named daniel mcnaughton poor mr drummond did not die at once but lingered for several hours it was believed by very many people myself among the number that it was a political assassination the secretary being taken for the premier but the man got off on a plea of insanity a plea which was very fashionable in favour of criminals at that time and highly conducive to their benefit an episode in the social history of england almost unknown to the rising generation was the reappearance in wales of rebecca and her daughters a riotous mob whose grievance was at first purely local they resisted the heavy and vexatious tolls to which by the mismanagement and abuses of the turnpike system they were subjected galled by this burden to which they were rendered more sensitive by reason of their poverty and hopeless of obtaining any assistance or relief by legitimate means the people resolved to take the law into their own hands and abate the source of so much annoyance and distress by the strong arm the first act of destruction of the toll-gates occurred in eighteen thirty nine and the gates then destroyed were particularly obnoxious to the people who entertained doubts of the legality of their erection they were broken down in open day with no attempt at concealment by a mob of persons rather in a spirit of mischievous frolic than otherwise the proposal to re-erect these gates on the part of the trustees was overruled by a large body of magistrates and gentlemen many of whom qualified for trustees expressly for the occasion this decision gave strength and encouragement to the discontented and no doubt prepared the way for further violence the gate-breakers had learned their power and though they did not immediately renew the exercise of it the lesson was not forgotten although it slumbered until the commencement of eighteen forty three when it appeared in a systematic and organized form this organization was called rebecca and her daughters their leader having taken this scriptural name from a misconception of the meaning of genesis twenty four sixty and they blessed rebecca and said unto her let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them this captain of the gate-breakers in the guise of a woman always made her marches and attacks by night and her conduct of the campaign manifested no small dexterity and address a sudden blowing of horns and firing of guns announced the arrival of the assailants at the turnpike selected for attack they were mounted on horseback and generally appeared in considerable force the leader who gave the word of command and directed the motion of those whom she called her daughters was attired in a female dress of some description wearing also a bonnet or head-dress which served the purpose of disguise her bodyguard were dressed up in similar manner immediately on arriving at the gate they commenced the business of the night and proceeded to raise gate posts and toll-house with an alacrity and perseverance which soon accomplished its purpose they generally sawed off the gate-posts close to the ground broke the gate to fragments and pulled down the toll-house to its foundations to show that the abatement of the specific grievance was their only object they commonly dealt very leniently with the toll-keeper offering him except in rare cases no personal violence and allowing him to remove his furniture and property which they never attempted to destroy or plunder the work was no sooner done than the mysterious assailants galloped off firing their guns and blowing their horns as before no trace nor clue was to be found of the quarter whence they had come or of the retreats to which they dispersed themselves nor did anything in the outward appearance of the country by day even when these nightly outrages were at their height give sign of the extension and compact organization which evidently subsisted among the population 
The first notice I can find in this year of these riots is in the times of 10 January, in which is the following paragraph from the Welshman. The state of society in Wales may surprise some of our English readers, especially when we acquaint them with the fact that there has been for some months past in the neighbourhood of St. Clair a mob of lawless depredators, amounting to about six hundred, who assembled nightly for the purpose of destroying the turnpike gates on the various lines of road in the neighbourhood of St. Clair these ruffians are headed by a very tall man dressed for disguise as a female who goes by the name of rebecca and as many of his associates are likewise dressed as females the whole gang have been christened rebecca and her daughters these men are nearly all ably mounted and are a terror to the neighbouring country the pill-trap gate has been destroyed a great number of times and as frequently replaced by the trustees of the road but immediately after its re-erection the fellows have invariably assembled in greater force than before and riding up to the gate the following interesting colloquy has taken place the leader of the mob addressing the others in welsh says my children this gate has no business here has it to which her children reply that it has not the mother then asked what is to be done with it when the children reply that it should be levelled with the ground they then immediately break it down and disperse in different directions this system has continued for a length of time and although a reward of fifty pounds has been offered not one of the offenders has been discovered about one hundred constables have been sworn in and three constables from london are down there but all precautions are ineffectual for so surely as the constables show the slightest diminution of their vigilance rebecca and her daughters appear and level the gates a very short time ago the policemen were after a fellow whom they suspected to belong to the gang and while at a public-house baiting their horse rebecca and her daughters suddenly came in sight and the affrighted officers of the law were obliged to fly for their lives the gates have now been re-erected and no fresh act of violence has occurred since the sixteenth ult but the organization of the depredators still continues and it is feared will break out with fresh violence if the constabulary force be removed that this movement was serious and no joke is evidenced by the fact that i have in my notes forty-five paragraphs in the times on the subject from Pembroke and Carmarthen it gradually spread to Cardiganshire on one side, and to Radnorshire and Glamorganshire on the other. Brecknockshire, alone of the South Wales counties, enjoyed exemption from these disturbances. The destruction which the rioters effected in some of these districts was most extensive and unsparing. There were at the time of the outbreak between 100 and 150 gates, including sidebars and chains in the county of carmarthen of these no less than between seventy and eighty were destroyed the toll-houses as well as the gates and posts being in many cases raised to the ground in some trusts not a single gate was left standing in pembrokeshire and in one of the divisions of cardiganshire the destruction was carried on in the same wholesale manner the trustees at first re-erected the gates which had been broken down but they were again as speedily demolished by the rioters again they were rebuilt and again they were levelled with the ground the trustees were at length compelled to desist and the roads were left free of toll none of these counties except glamorgan possessed a paid constabulary or any other force which could be of avail in checking the proceedings of the rioters and the magistrates finding all local efforts unavailing were obliged to appeal to government for protection and support one of the boldest steps ventured on by the insurgents whose confidence was of course much increased by their uninterrupted success was an entry which was made at midday into the town of carmarthen by a large body of persons on the tenth of june about noon the rioters began to march into the town through the water street gate which they had destroyed some time before they were headed by a band the leading body consisted of some thousands on foot many of whom were chartists and rabble of the town 
A large number of women was among the crowd, and men bearing inflammatory placards. They were followed by a man in disguise representing Rebecca, some bearing brooms with which to sweep the foundations of the toll-house and the workhouse, and the rear was brought up by about three hundred farmers on horseback. They paraded the town, passing the hall and hooting the magistrates, and proceeded to the workhouse, which they attacked. They climbed over the high wall with which the building was surrounded, and then burst open the lodge gates and the porter's door. The horsemen rode into the yard and surrounded the premises, and the rioters on foot soon forced an entrance into the building and commenced their work of destruction. While the rioters were in the act of pulling down the inner doors and partitions of the boardroom and other parts of the premises, and pitching the beds out of windows, the governor was ringing the alarm bell, and in the midst of the tumult came the military. Representations of the excited state of the neighborhood had been sent to the home office, and a troop of the fourth light dragoons had been ordered from Cardiff. An express from Carmarthen had met the dragoons at four o'clock in the morning, just after they had passed through Neath, and were still thirty-one miles from their destination. They pushed on, riding the last fifteen miles in an hour and a half, two horses dying from fatigue as they entered the town. They were met by one of the magistrates who led them to the workhouse and read the riot act. The rioters were summoned to surrender, but they made an attempt to rush on the military. The dragoons charged, using the flat of their swords, and soon put the rioters outside the wall to flight. Those within offered some resistance, and for a moment the edge of the sword was turned upon them when they succumbed. Many escaped over the wall, but about a hundred were taken prisoners, and several horses were abandoned by their riders. The disturbance, which menaced so seriously the safety of the town, was thus happily put an end to, without any bloodshed or calamitous result. As time advanced, the insurrection, which had at first been lightly thought of, and for which much allowance had been made, under the belief that the people had real grievances to complain of, assumed a more malignant and dangerous aspect. The farmers and peasantry, who in their impatience under the vexations of the tolls had commenced it, soon fell into the hands of ill-disposed and designing men, who aggravated the excitement that prevailed, and availed themselves of the name and disguise of Rebecca in order to carry out their own evil and lawless purposes. Threatening letters were one of the means most freely resorted to, and great numbers under the signature of Rebecca were sent about the country, conveying the most sanguinary menaces to those whose conduct had in any way given offence to the dastardly writers. Certain rules were laid down by conclaves of the disaffected respecting the occupation of farms, and all who presumed to contradict the edicts of this invisible authority were marked out and denounced as victims to the just vengeance of Rebecca. The more active magistrates, as well as the tithe-owners and clergy, were made the special objects of this cowardly system of intimidation. In some instances the rioters proved that their threats were not without meaning. Guns were fired into the houses of persons who had fallen under the popular displeasure. Some had their property fired or otherwise injured, and a growing feeling of alarm and insecurity began to pervade the peaceable and well-disposed portion of the community. This feeling was further increased by a cold-blooded and shocking act of murder committed on a poor woman who kept a turnpike called the Hendy Gate on the confines of Glamorganshire and Carmarthenshire. A party of rioters came to attack the gate at which she lived, and one of the number, actuated by some motive which was not distinctly accounted for, fired at her and shot her dead. A coroner's inquest sat upon the body and all the facts attending the revolting transaction were fully and clearly stated in evidence. But such was the excitement of feeling then prevailing in the neighborhood, or such the influence of fear exercised over the minds of the jurymen who investigated the case, that they actually brought in a verdict that the deceased died from suffusion of blood, which produced suffocation, but from what cause is to the jurors unknown. 
By the continuance of these outrages, which threatened ere long to disorganize society and render the tenure of life and property in Wales insecure, the government were at length aroused to the necessity of adopting very vigorous measures for the enforcement and vindication of the law. A large body of troops was sent down to Wales, and a general officer of skill and experience appointed to the command of the disturbed districts. A strong body of London police was imported to exercise their skill in ferreting out the actors in these lawless exploits, who had so long succeeded in eluding detection. The districts most infested by the Rebeccaites were closely occupied by parties of soldiers, some of whom were quartered at short intervals in the villages and hamlets wherein mischief was suspected to lurk, and in the neighbourhood of turnpike gates which had previously been the objects of attack. It was not, however, the policy of the insurgents to place themselves in open collision with the soldiers, but the clandestine and shifting mode of warfare which they had adopted with so much success was but imperfectly counteracted by the presence of a military force. Under cover of the night, and with the advantages afforded by a knowledge of the country and the sympathy of the population, they could sweep down a gate which was but the work of a few minutes with very little risk of interruption or discovery the presence of the police and soldiers if it could not entirely put an end to the attacks on the turnpikes prevented the disaffected from proceeding to further acts of violence and checked the growth of a conspiracy which might otherwise have gone to the full length of open rebellion from this and other causes the spirit of disturbance in wales began to decline about the latter end of the summer the most obnoxious of the turnpike gates had been swept away and on some of the trusts the trustees had announced their determination not to re-erect those which were most complained of as oppressive some of the more active leaders of the riots were captured in an affray with the county police on the borders of glamorganshire and the terrors of a special commission impended over the principality the movement was even dramatized and on twenty september at the royal amphitheatre liverpool was produced a new play called rebecca and her daughters or paddy the policeman the programme of scenery etc as described on the playbill being vigilance of the civil and military authorities one hundred pounds reward for the apprehension of rebecca and of ten pounds for each of her daughters false alarm invincible courage of the yeomanry arrival of the london police in disguise paddywhack undertakes to capture the delinquents admonitions to the constabulary the inspection mysterious appearance of rebecca and her daughters in the glen of clandilo at midnight tried before the justice of the peace happy denouement i can find only one reference to rebecca in connection with london and that refers to a bar in gower street which was taken down some few years since it occurs in the times of thirty september during the last two or three days considerable excitement has prevailed in the northern suburbs of the metropolis in consequence of rumours obtaining circulation that threatening notices had been posted about signed rebecca intimating that it was the intention of that lady and her daughters to destroy the various turnpike and other gates which they were pleased to term public obstructions it appears that these rumours were not altogether unfounded for whether intended as a joke or otherwise the doings of the notorious rebecca and her daughters in wales have in reality found persons foolhardy enough to follow their example in london a few evenings since mr hill the porter and keeper of the gate at the london university college which crosses gower street and prevents carriages from passing along the front of university college hospital received a letter with the signature of rebecca attached declaring it to be the intention of herself and others to remove the obstruction called a gate on the following night mr hill thinking the matter a joke took no notice of the circumstance but to his astonishment early in the morning following the night on which the threatened attack was promised he was awakened by the night porter who informed him that the gate a large wooden one such as the ordinary toll-bars was gone 
On examination it was found that not only had the large padlock by which it was fastened been broken and carried away, but the gate had absolutely been filed off its hinges and conveyed by the depredators into the college grounds and hidden behind some shrubs. The gate has again been reinstated, but since the occurrence, Mr. Hill has received another threatening notice, informing him that it is the intention of Rebecca and her daughters, on Monday night next, to effect its entire destruction. What is most extraordinary in connection with the affair is that the gate should have been removed without the knowledge of the police, the beats of two constables joining close to the spot, or that of the night porters, either at the college or the hospital. It is to be remarked that frequent complaints have been made at the erection of the gate in question, as it interrupts the otherwise direct communication between Holborn and Broad Street, Bloomsbury, with the Hampstead Road, and compels carriages, etc., to go considerably out of the way round Sussex and University Streets before they can get into the new road. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Gretna Green Parsons, Number of Marriages, Chinese Indemnity, Thames Tunnel, The Serial Machine, Treasure Trove, Accidents to Mr. Brunel, Arkwright's Will, Secession in the Scotch Church, The Gent, Shakespeare's Autograph. At this time Gretna Green marriages were in full blast, they were only made unlawful in 1856, and we learn from the Carlisle Journal, copied into the Times of 20 February, something about the Parsons. We observe by announcement in some of the London papers that some worthy gentlemen in London are about to enlighten the public on the subject of Gretna Green marriages by the publication of a book called The Gretna Green Memoirs by Robert Elliot with an introduction and appendix by the Rev. Caleb Brown. In addition to this information, we have been honoured with a copy of what Mr. Elliot calls a circular, which he is desirous we should publish as a paragraph for the benefit of our readers. From this circular, we learn that this interesting work contains an accurate account of remarkable elopements, pursuits, anecdotes, etc., never before published, then we are further informed that there is in the press to be published by subscription the gretna green register containing the names of seven thousand seven hundred and forty four persons married by robert elliot the gretna green parson it is added that the whole is being carefully printed from original registers written and kept by himself the gretna green parson we suspect has fallen into dishonest hands or he would not have suffered it to be said that he was about to publish registers which never had existence the gretna green parson is pretty well known in this neighbourhood he married a granddaughter of old joe paisley the original blacksmith and after the death of that worthy parson he set up an opposition shop in the marriage line to david lang who had acquired some notoriety in the business this was in 1811, and he continued to uh, trade until 1822, when it either fell away from him or he from it. His reverence subsequently condescended to act as horsekeeper or hostler at one of the inns in this city, and a few months ago was sent for to London as a witness in some marriage case, and is now set up as an author. We suspect the whole thing is an attempt to gull the public into the purchase of a book of inventions if seven thousand were deducted from the names of those to be inserted in the register the number would still exceed by many a score those who were actually married as it is called by robert elliot the gretna green parson the poor parson could not stand this attack on his veracity and wrote a letter to the times which appeared in its issue of twenty three february in which he does not deny the bulk of the paragraph taken from the carlisle journal but gives his figures as to his matrimonial business. He says that in the following years he married so many couples. Reader's Note. Here follows a chart of figures from 1811 through 1839. End note. 
He says he married 7,744 persons, but either his arithmetic according to the above account is faulty, or there is an inaccuracy in the Times figures. On 3 March arrived in London the first installment of the Chinese indemnity, one million pounds, all in silver. I remember seeing the dock wagons guarded by soldiers and wondering, until told, what they contained. Some more arrived on the 7th. The Thames Tunnel was opened to the public on 25 March, with as much ceremony as a private company could manage. There were the Lord Mayor, the directors, and a host of scientific persons who solemnly went in procession down the staircase on the Rotterite side, passed along the western archway of the tunnel, ascended and descended the staircase at Wapping, and returned through the eastern archway. In the evening there was a grand dinner at the London Tavern, where prosperity to the Thames Tunnel was drunk in some wine which had been preserved from the commencement of the enterprise to celebrate its completion. As with motor-cars, so with aeronautics, the time of which I write was well in advance. We know of Signor Santos Dumont's performances with his motor balloon in connection with the Eiffel Tower, but Mr. Samuel Henson was before him in applying mechanical power in aeronautics. He took out a patent, number 9478, dated 29 September 1842, for apparatus and machinery for conveying letters, goods, and passengers from place to place through the air. It was an aeroplane. The car, which contained passengers, engineers, engines, etc., was suspended in the center of a framework which combined strength with lightness, covered with a light but close woven fabric. It was started by descending an inclined plane, the impetus from which caused it to rise in the air when the steam engine was put in action to continue its motion. The area of the sustaining surface was some 4,500 square feet, and the weight to be borne by it, including the carriage, etc., was estimated at 3,000 pounds, which was claimed to be considerably less per square foot than that of many birds. In April 1843, but on what exact date I do not know, an experimental voyage was made from the hill of Dumbuck near Glasgow by Professor Gilles. He successfully negotiated the descent of the inclined plane, and rapidly rose in the air until he reached an altitude of nearly three miles. Feeling giddy, he determined to descend to a mile and a half above the earth. This I easily effected by depressing the tail of the machine, which up to this moment I had kept at an angle with a horizon of nine and three-quarter degrees to that of forty-five. My course I had not varied since leaving the hill. It was, per compass, southwest, and by west, half-west, passing over Ayrshire, and in a direct line from Dumbuck to Ailsa Craig, whither, indeed, I was tending, with the view of landing, the latter being admirably suited for launching the machine in a similar way to that adopted at Dumbuck, on my return home again. Daylight had now broken, and the scene was most gorgeous. I passed many ships, and in particular one steamer, but whose paltry speed in comparison with mine was nothing. Alas, however, this is not destined to last, for just as I had shot ahead of the steamer, something went wrong with the machinery, and the fanners stopped. This did not at all alarm me, for as described by Mr. Henson, these fanners are only necessary for propulsion, and not at all requisite for maintaining the machine in the air. Unfortunately, however, I perfectly forgot, in the hurry of the moment, to remove the weights from the safety valve, and the effects from this were disastrous in the extreme. The great accumulation of steam that took place was too much for the pipes, and consequently, bang, went three of them at the same instant. The machine, at this exact moment, feeling its equilibrium altered, surged considerably, and the remaining pipes necessarily followed the example of the others. Fizz, biz, whiz, away they went, one after the other, like pop-guns. Unfortunately, one of these pipes, in flying off, struck a bamboo stretcher, and shattered it so, that the machine, losing balance on one side, toppled over and became perfectly unmanageable. 
She, in fact, whirled over and over in a way that may be imagined, but which is altogether impossible to describe. I, of course, was now descending with fearful rapidity, and nothing was left me to contemplate but death and destruction. I can only compare my sensations at this moment to those experienced in a nightmare, which, every one knows, are not the most agreeable in the world. Sensibility now forsook me, and, indeed, this was not to be wondered at, in consequence of the whirling of the machine. On coming to my senses again, I found myself in bed, with severe headache, nausea, and vomiting, the usual accompaniments of such a flight through the air. But thanks to Providence, I am now in a fair way of recovery, and willing to perform the same feat again. Luckily for the aeronaut, the accident was seen by the master of a steamer, who sent a boat to his assistance, but the machine was lost. We often hear of treasure trove, but seldom find the owner. However, here is a case. On 11 April, the magistrate at Clerkenwell Police Court had a man named Benjamin Thomas and five other laborers brought before him under the following circumstances. It seems they had been recently engaged in grubbing up the roots of some trees in Tufnell Park, Holloway, when they found, buried in the earth, two jars full of sovereigns, supposed to have amounted to 400 pounds. They divided the money between them, but it was claimed by Mr. Henry Tufnell as lord of the manor, and all of them consented to give up what they had except Thomas, who said that his share was fifty-one pounds, but that he had spent or lost it. The sum recovered only amounted to two hundred and thirty-one pounds seventeen shillings. Thomas was remanded for a few days, but in the interval a new claimant appeared in the person of Mr. Joseph Frost, of the firm of J. and J. Frost, brass founders in clerkenwell it appeared that some time in august last year in a temporary fit of mental delusion he had carried the money out at night and buried it mr tufnell waived his claim in favour of mr frost and thomas was committed for trial on the charge of feloniously appropriating the money to his own use a very curious accident happened to brunel the eminent engineer he was playing with the child of a friend, pretending to swallow a half-sovereign and bring it out of his ear when it slipped and stuck in his trachea, whence it could not be dislodged. This must have been in the latter part of April, for it is mentioned in the times of 28 April as having occurred some short time previously. All efforts of the surgeons could not reach the coin, even though they constructed a machine which suspended him by the heels when he was shaken and thumped. On 27 April, Sir B. Brodie performed tracheotomy on the unfortunate gentleman, but without avail, so they waited until he had somewhat recovered, and again hung him up by his heels. This was on 13 May, and after a few gentle thumps, the half-sovereign quitted its place, and dropped out of his mouth without causing him any pain or inconvenience in these days millionaires and multi-millionaires are exceedingly common but not so in the time of which i write and much astonishment was created at the sum of money which mr richard arkwright son of sir richard the inventor of the spinning jenny left behind him his will was proved on twenty four may in canterbury prerogative court and his personal property was sworn to exceed one million pounds, the stamp duty on the probate of which was fifteen thousand pounds, which was the highest duty then payable when the testator's personal estate was one million pounds or upwards. In this case the deceased left behind him a fortune of nearly three million pounds. The 18th of May is memorable in the Presbyterian Church of Scotland for the great succession of its members and the foundation of the Free Church. This was the day appointed for the opening of the General Assembly, and Dr. Welsh, the moderator of the former Assembly, took the chair. As soon as business commenced, he read a protest from those who were dissatisfied with the then state of the Church. It was a very long document, and having read it, the doctor and those who were of the same opinion quietly left the hall forming a procession and marching four abreast to a hall in cannon mills where they elected dr chalmers as their moderator a contemporary account of this movement is given in the observer of twenty nine may 
the number of clergymen who have seceded from the church of scotland is now four hundred and fifty and it cannot be a question that by the middle of the week the number will be close on five hundred this is nearly the half of the entire clergy the number being under twelve hundred among the leaders will be found the name of almost every minister distinguished for talent moral worth or weight of character nearly the whole of the people have left the establishment with their ministers so that the free presbyterian church instituted by those who have left the establishment may be considered the church of scotland the general impression in scotland is that the residuary church cannot long exist about two hundred and forty thousand pounds have been raised in less than ten weeks for the erection of new churches and for the support of the seceding clergy and there can be no question that in a few weeks the amount will considerably exceed three hundred thousand pounds among the contributors are the marchioness of brendeldane a thousand pounds a colonel in the army whose name we do not remember six thousand pounds in three yearly installments of two thousand pounds mr henry paul a private gentleman two thousand pounds mr nisbet bookseller london one thousand pounds a dissenter five hundred pounds and there are various other subscriptions of two thousand and one thousand pounds each mr fox mall is to build and endow a church at his own expense mr a campbell member for argyleshire is to do the same in elgin the pious and spirited inhabitants have raised a thousand pounds to build a church for the rev alexander top a young and popular minister and they will also liberally contribute to his support so that in many instances churches will be built and ministers be provided for solely by private munificence and local exertion without requiring any aid from the general fund the general assembly of the establishment is now sitting in edinburgh but its proceedings excite little interest the general assembly of the free church which the people recognize as the church of scotland is also sitting in edinburgh and its proceedings excite an intensity of interest hitherto unparalleled in the ecclesiastical history of scotland about this time there arose an objectionable class of men who tried to ape the gentleman but could not and they went by the generic term of gents punch was death upon them and i give one of the satirist's onslaughts as it reproduces the costumes and amusements of the day first let us see the gent pictorially and then afterwards read what manner of animal he was an act for amending the public deportment of certain individuals called gents abiding in london and other places whereas it having been represented that there are at present existing in the metropolis as well as in the provincial districts certain individuals known and spoken of as gents whose bearing and manners are perfectly at variance with the characters which from a monomania they appear desirous of assuming and whereas in consequence of cheap clothes imitative dispositions and intellectual poverty this class is greatly on the increase it has been thought necessary that this act should be framed to control their vicious habits may it therefore please your majesty that it be enacted and be it enacted henceforth that all gents not actually in the employ of the morning post or mr simpson of the albion be prevented from wearing white cravats at parties the same being evidently an attempt of sixth-rate individuals to ape the manners of first-class circles and that no gent who does not actually keep a horse and is not in the army be allowed to strut up and down the burlington arcade with a whip and mustachios such imposition being exceedingly offensive and amounting to a passive swindling of the spectators and be it enacted that all such things as light blue stocks large figured shawls cheap primrose gloves white chesterfield coal sacks half-guinea albert boots in fact all these articles ticketed in the shop windows as gents last style be considered the distinctive marks of the class and condemned accordingly and that every individual moreover smoking outside an omnibus sticking large pins in his cravat wearing fierce studs in his shirt walking with others four abreast in regent street 
reading slang publications and adopting their language playing billiards in public rooms and sporting dingy white gloves in the slips of the theatres frequenting night taverns and being on terms of familiarity with the singers and waiters thinking great things of champagne as if everything at a party depended upon it and especially wearing the hat on one side be the signs of most unmitigated gents and shunned equally with hydrophobia and be it further enacted that no gent be in future allowed to cross a hired horse with a view to ten shillings worth of sunday display in the parks the turnout being always detected nor shall be permitted to drive a gig in a fierce scarf under similar circumstances nor shall any gent imagine that an acquaintance with all the questionable resorts of london is knowing life or that trousers of large check pattern are anything but exceeding gentish saving always that the gents have not the sense to endeavour bettering their condition which is exceedingly probable under which circumstances they had better remain as they are in ignorance of their melancholy position but on the other hand it is commanded that people of common intellect henceforth cease to designate any of their male friends as gents the word being one of exceedingly bad style and equally objectionable with genteel which is possibly derived from it and that if after this any one speaks of a gent or party he knows it is ordered that such speaker be immediately set down as one of the unfortunate class in question the shakespeare autograph which was sold on twenty four may eighteen forty one came again into the market and was bought on nineteen may for a hundred and forty five pounds by the corporation of the city of london the patres conscripti of the common council were not of one mind as to the eligibility of the purchase on the motion that the court agree to the report and that the chamberlain be instructed to pay the sum mr wharton rose to move as an amendment that the report should lie upon the table a laugh and loud cries of hear hear he had he said done all he could in the committee to prevail upon the members that the purchase of the autograph was a most wasteful and prodigal expenditure hear hear and no no the precedent was a most mischievous one if the court sanctioned such a proceeding as that which the report had described by and by the autographs of archbishops and bishops and other individuals who had in times long past distinguished themselves would supply apologies for wasting the city cash in order to gratify gentlemen who were afflicted with the description of mania laughter he hoped the court would not catch the infection but seconded his rational effort to check it by condemning the report to its proper station on the table after all the document was doubtful but there was no doubt at all as to the profligacy of the expenditure laughter and cries of hear hear and no no mr knott said it was quite ridiculous to think for a moment of voting a hundred and forty five pounds for a few doubtful illegible almost obliterated scratches of a pen laughter and cries of hear hear he defied any man on earth to say what those scratches represented on a division there were for the motion forty one for the amendment thirty one End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of gossip in the first decade of victoria's reign by john ashton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one exhibition of cartoons a duel a monster gambling the albert hat nelson's statue fun thereon soldier savings banks a postboy and lord mayor's show m julien and his orchestra prince albert as a farmer george the fourth statue ojibway indians the public exhibition of cartoons for the frescoes for the new palace of westminster took place in westminster hall on three july there were a hundred and forty subjects altogether varying in size from fifteen feet to ten feet square none being admitted over or under those standards 
Prizes of £300 each were awarded to Armitage, Watts, and Cope, of £200 to Calcutt, Bell, and Townsend, of £100 to Frost, Harris, Silas, Bridges, and Severn, the judges being the Marquis of Lansdowne, Sir R. Peel, and Messrs. S. Rogers, Westacott, Cook, and Eddy. The cartoons remained in Westminster Hall for six months, and in November were removed to the Suffolk Street Gallery. They were finally adjudicated upon by the Royal Commission of Fine Arts on 12 July 1844, and the successful artists chosen to execute frescoes were Cope, Horsley, Dice, Maclise, Redgrave, and Cave Thomas. The practice of dueling was fast dying out, and I give the following case as being nearly one of the last, and one in which the second and surgeon were tried for being accessory to murder. Two brothers-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel Fawcett of the 55th Regiment and Lieutenant Monroe of the Royal Horse Guards, quarrelled, and on the morning of the 1st July fought a duel with pistols in a field at the back of the Brecknock Arms Tavern in Camden Road. Lieutenant Colonel Fawcett fell, mortally wounded, and died on the 3rd July. The coroner's jury found Lieutenant Monroe and the two seconds guilty of willful murder and the surgeon as guilty in the second degree only as it was believed he was present only as medical attendant lieutenant monroe and his second got out of the way but lieutenant colonel fawcett's second and the surgeon were tried at the central criminal court on twenty five august no evidence was tendered against the surgeon and he was at once discharged and the jury found the second not guilty lieutenant monroe's second surrendered himself was tried on 14 February 1844 and acquitted. Lieutenant Monroe was cashiered from the army for being absent without leave. He afterwards surrendered and was tried 18 August 1847, found guilty and sentenced to death, which sentence was commuted to 12 months imprisonment in Newgate. The Times of 30 June, quoting the Reading Mercury, has the following. A monster... A day or two since, a gentleman travelling along the road near Colnbrook had his attention attracted to the screams of a child in the care of a tramping woman, who had with her two other children totally blind. The cries of the child were so distressing that he insisted on knowing the cause, but not getting a satisfactory answer, he forcibly removed a bandage from its eyes, when, horrid to relate, he found these encased with two small perforated shells in which were two live black beetles for the purpose of destroying the sight. The woman was instantly seized and given into custody, and at the magistrate's meeting at Eton on Wednesday last committed for trial. There is too much reason to fear that the wretch produced the blindness of the other two children by similar means. This was rendered into a street ballad. A correspondent pointed out that it was well known to all who passed through the parish of St. James at night that the district absolutely swarmed with gaming-houses. There was, in fact, no concealment about the matter, as the keepers vied with each other in illuminating their doors and windows to attract the notice of their victims. How was it that this disgrace was permitted to exist from season to season? The police seemed satisfied with the occasional conviction of one or more minor delinquents from the neighbourhood of Leicester Square, but the leviathans in crime were allowed to continue their nightly course of profligacy and plunder with impunity. The French authorities, by a law which was strictly enforced, entirely swept away this nuisance from their capital, notoriously for years the very hotbed of the vice of gaming but we were lamentably behind our neighbours for while we boasted of a court pure in morals and strict in the performance of every religious duty we allowed the sabbath to be desecrated and the palace of the sovereign to be contaminated by the close vicinage of houses expressly open for the practice of this demoralising habit are we much better now at the latter end of October, a new headdress for the infantry was proposed, and Prince Albert was universally credited as being its godfather, but public opinion was so unequivocally expressed against it that it was never likely to be popular. 
It was neither soldier-like nor appropriate, and bore a strong resemblance to the old Hessian cap, which was introduced into the German service. The headgear was covered with black cloth, the crown and brim being of black varnished leather, the band was of white worsted, as was the tuft which was placed on a ball of red worsted. Beneath this ball was a royal crown, under which was a Maltese cross, in the centre of which was inscribed the number of the regiment. Punch was especially severe upon the Albert hat, and with the pictorial satire of Prince Albert's studio, by the way, the hat is in no ways exaggerated, is the following. Ever since the accession of Prince Albert to the royal husbandship of these realms, he has devoted the energies of his mind and the ingenuity of his hands to the manufacture of infantry caps, cavalry trousers, and regulation sabretashes. One of his first measures was to transmogrify the pantaloons of the 11th Hussars, and, as the regiment alluded to is Prince Albert's own, his royal highness may do as he likes with his own and no one can complain of his bedizening the legs of the unfortunate eleventh with scarlet cloth and gold door leather when however the prince throwing the whole of his energies into a hat proposed to encase the heads of the british soldiery in a machine which seemed a decided cross between a muff a coal scuttle and a slop pail then punch was compelled to interfere for the honour of the British Army. The result has been that the headgear has been summarily withdrawn by an order from the War Office, and the manufacture of more of the Albert hat has been absolutely prohibited. Greatness of mind is shown in various ways by different individuals. Hannibal was a great cutter-out, for he cut a passage through the Alps, but Prince Albert cuts out Hannibal, inasmuch as His Royal Highness devotes his talent to the cutting out of coats and things inexpressible. The Prince's studio could not fail to be an object of interest to the readers of Punch. We have, therefore, at an enormous sacrifice of time and specie, obtained a view of it. On the morning of November 3, at 4 a.m., the raising of a portion of the colossal statue of Nelson on the pillar in Trafalgar Square commenced. This figure is seventeen feet high from its base to the top of the hat, and is made of stone from the Granton Quarry belonging to the Duke of Buckley. It weighs nearly eighteen tons, and, needless to say, is made in segments. These were put together before it was raised to show the public, and during the two days it was on view, it was visited by one hundred thousand persons the building this column had seemed slow but that was nothing compared to its completion the bas-reliefs were long in being placed and it was not until thirty one january eighteen sixty seven that landseer's four couchant lions were exposed to public gaze of the progress of its building punch twenty five november eighteen forty three has some very fine fooling the Nelson Column Drama The earliest announcement of the late Covent Garden management was a piece entitled Trevolger Square or The Nelson Monument. We have obtained the following slight information respecting it. The drama is described as a grand architectural and historical burletta in two acts, and the prologue was to have been spoken by Mr. Widdicombe as time. The two acts comprise the commencement and completion, and a lapse of twenty years is supposed to take place between them, in which time the boy, who is the principal character, becomes a middle-aged man. The following speech is very fine. The boy inquires of the mason when the column will be finished, who replies, in an interval of the stake banquet which they are enjoying together, Mason i've asked that fearful question of the stars who wink responding of the board of works whose works have bored us of the misty moon towards whose lodgings after years of toil we rise no nearer all were still but now whilst gazing on that steak of beef sent up to form our capital repast and cheer us in our lonely solitude i hope the best the best can hope no more twill rise like college honours by degrees and to our limbs a pillar be of ease our hearts are warm although upon the freeze
The following duet is also introduced by the man and the boy in the second act. Boy. I remember, I remember, when I was a little boy, on the column in November, I was given some employ. I helped the man to build it, and we labored hard and long, but the granite came up slowly, for we were not very strong. I remember, I remember, how we raised its form on high, with one block in December, and another in July. Both we remember we remember when st martin's bells were rung in the laying of the first stone for we both were very young but weary years have passed now since we our work begun we fear we shall not last now to see our labor done we remember we remember but we heard it on the sly twon't be finished next november nor the subsequent july very early in november a war office circular dated thirty one october was issued to regulate and establish regimental savings banks which have done so much to encourage thrift among our soldiers the maximum of each soldier's deposit was limited to thirty pounds in any one year and to two hundred in the whole the rate of interest on deposits was fixed at three pounds fifteen shillings per hundred per annum but no interest was to be allowed upon less than six shillings eight pence and thirteen shillings four pence nor upon any sums that had not remained on deposit for at least one month to be reckoned from the last monthly muster day in the times of ten november is the following a rather amusing scene took place in cheapside yesterday shortly before the lord mayor's procession to westminster whilst the streets were blocked up against the passage of vehicles and horses one of those sharp little urchins known by the generic title of the twopenny cavalry who rattled through the streets with her majesty's suburban mails was stopped opposite bow church by a party of police who told him they acted under the orders of the lord mayor the postboy with all the dignity of her majesty's representative assuming an air of great condescension assured the police that he had the highest possible respect for the lord mayor but being express upon her majesty's business he was determined to proceed the police persisted in stopping him a crowd collected and it was clear their sympathy sided with the postboy who carried himself throughout the controversy with great courage calmness and self-possession the police had by this time seized the bridle whilst the boy endeavoured to force his way forward backed by the strenuous exertions of his steed who also appeared as if inspired by the authority of a royal commission the postboy finding physical force insufficient tried what authority would do and threatened them with the vengeance of the home secretary for attempting to stop her majesty's mails this had the desired effect of bringing the police to a parley and as the postboy was backed by popular applause he gained momentarily in the discussion but did not complete his advantage until he took out a memorandum book and began coolly to note down the numbers of the constables this stroke was decisive they at once capitulated merely stipulating that they should have his address in return to this he readily assented and searched diligently for his card case but that mark of gentility was not at hand he however made a page from his memorandum book serve his purpose and took his leave amid the loud congratulations of the applauding crowd with the following pithy address to the constables i can't well see what use you are a hundred years ago there were no police and lord mayor's shows went off better than they do now for my part i can't see what you do here at all for you know he added with a significant grin you know you don't look so very well in a procession shouts of laughter followed the postboy's brief speech as he rode on triumphantly it was about this time that m louis antoine julien to whom we owe so much for the popularization of good music and for the improvement of our orchestras came into notoriety as a caterer for the public's amusement and for his promenade concerts 
These had been popular in the open air at Vauxhall, Ranelagh, Marylebone, and other public gardens, but the first, under cover, was given in 1838 at the Lyceum Theatre, or, as it was then called, the English Opera House, when the pit was boarded over and an orchestra erected on the stage exactly as we are now so familiar with. Julienne, in 1838, had been unlucky in Paris, was bankrupt, and came to London, where in 1840 he was assistant to Eliasson, the violinist and conductor of an orchestra of 100 performers and a small chorus. Next year, Julienne was the conductor, and in 1842, on 2 December, he started for himself at the English Opera House the series of promenade concerts with which his name will always be associated he always would have the very best musicians that he could find for his orchestra and in this year eighteen forty three among them were barrett bauman harper kernig richardson hill lazarus patey howell and jarrett and in after years he had such soloists as ernst sibury botzini viniski and santon in eighteen fifty seven he came financially to grief he then went to paris was imprisoned for debt in clichy in eighteen fifty nine and died in a lunatic asylum on fourteen march eighteen sixty in his later years he became much stouter than he is here represented and as a conductor posed a great deal too much those of my readers who recollect him will acknowledge the truth of the following description of him when conducting his british army quadrilles taken from his biography in grove's history of music and musicians with coat thrown widely open white waistcoat elaborately embroidered shirt front wristbands of extravagant length turned back over his cuffs a wealth of black hair and a black moustache itself a striking novelty he wielded his baton, encouraged his forces, repressed the turbulence of his audience with indescribable gravity and magnificence, went through all the pantomime of the British Army or Navy quadrille, seized a violin or a piccolo at the moment of climax, and at last sunk exhausted into his gorgeous velvet chair. All pieces of Beethoven's were conducted with a jeweled baton, and in a pair of clean kid gloves handed him at the moment on a silver salver prince albert took a great interest in agriculture and his flemish farm at windsor was a model but it was hard to make the average englishman believe that a foreigner could ever do any good as a farmer and john leach drew a fancy portrait of the prince in punch twenty five november where it illustrates a portion of a speech of Sir Robert Peel at Tamworth. Prince Albert has turned his attention to the promotion of agriculture, and if you have seen, as most probably you have, an account of the sale of Prince Albert's stock and the price they fetched, I have not the slightest doubt you will give one cheer more to Prince Albert as a British farmer. In the beginning of December, the bronze equestrian statue of George IV was set up on a pedestal at the northeast corner of Trafalgar Square. It is the work of Chantry, and was intended to be mounted on the marble arch, which was originally the gateway to Buckingham Palace, until its removal to Cumberland Gate, Hyde Park, in 1851. In the very early part of December, some of Her Majesty's subjects, Canadian Indians, from the northeastern shores of Lake Huron, came to visit England. They were of the Ojibwe tribe, and were nine in number, two old chiefs, four warriors, two women, and a little girl, ten years old. On the 20th of December, they were presented to the Queen at Windsor, and received from Her Majesty a check for twenty pounds and a quantity of gorgeous plaid with which to astonish the other natives on their return they afterwards exhibited themselves danced war dances etc at the egyptian hall at an admission fee of half a crown End of chapter twenty one Chapter 22 of A Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 A Child for Sale, 
trial and so forth of daniel o'connell general tom thumb his visit to the queen the polka how to dance it julien's grand polka the times of nineteen january copies the following from the worcester chronicle a child for sale the following extraordinary letter was received a short time ago by a gentleman in the neighbourhood of Tewkesbury from a person residing here the letter is dated from a certain court in this town but we omit the precise locality and the writer's name hoping that without pursuing the exposure to that extent it will be sufficient to teach him that natural affection is not to be made a matter of bargain and sale and that it is the duty of a parent himself to cherish the child which he has been the means of bringing into the world sir having heard that you expressed a wish to have a child and did not mind giving a sum of money as an inducement i flatter myself that i have it in my power to furnish you with one to answer your purpose in every respect it is a boy two years old a good-looking healthy spirited child and sound in wind and limb and that you can rear him up to suit your inclination you can send word by the bearer and appoint any time to inspect the child with every wish in this book of gossip to steer as clear of politics as possible yet it would belie its name were the famous trial of daniel o'connell not to be mentioned repeal of the union was his watchword and perpetual cry and with it he stirred up the irish people to a pitch when he found it difficult to manage and restrain them on sixteen march eighteen forty three was held at trim the first of great public meetings which he designed but did not carry out and on fifteen august was a monster meeting on the hill of tara but the one to be held at clontarf on eight october was to have eclipsed its predecessors but this was forbidden by the government and a week later warrants were issued for the arrest of o'connell his son john and his chief colleagues on a charge of conspiring to create discontent and disaffection among the liege subjects of the queen and with contriving by means of intimidation and the demonstration of great physical force to procure and effect changes to be made in the government laws and constitution of this realm o'connell was allowed bail but on eight november a true bill was found by the jury yet the trial did not take place till the fifteenth january of this year on the twelfth february the jury returned a verdict of guilty of unlawful and seditious conspiracy but judgment was not delivered till thirty may when he was sentenced to imprisonment for twelve months a fine of two thousand pounds and to find surety to keep the peace for seven years he had to go to prison where he was well treated and allowed to see his friends his sentence was appealed against and reversed in the house of lords on four september eighteen forty four when he was instantly liberated during all this time there was great excitement people wearing repeal buttons one of which is here delineated and other emblems while the uncrowned king of ireland was presented at mullamast with a velvet cap surmounted with shamrocks and having a green tassel the cap in fact with which readers of punch are so familiar of course his release from prison was an occasion to be made the most of an amphitheatrical triumphal car was provided and upon it were mounted o'connell his son and the rev dr miley and this gimcrack piece of property was drawn by six horses ridden by postilions the following is an account by an eye-witness the ovation commenced at two o'clock first came the trades of dublin each preceded by the banner of its body and a band played such music as only temperance bands can play and generally with much discrimination selecting rather difficult pieces for their performance and eschewing all national airs the banners were usually displayed from coaches intended to hold four but contriving to allow from sixteen to eighteen to fit into and hang on by them thus they came on bricklayers with a painting of the bank of ireland and the superscription of our old house at home slaters woollen operatives in a small open car 
Nailers, with a picture of Brian Broyam nailing the Danes at Clontarf. Coachmakers, tailors, with a very gorgeous equipage, six horses, postilions, and outriders. Tin plate workers, displaying as their sign a man with a tin helmet on his head and a dish cover of the same metal on his arm otherwise unassumingly attired in a blue coat and white trousers and other bodies of tradesmen too numerous to mention with their appropriate emblems and banners next came a number of repeal wardens wearing wands and occupying respectable-looking coaches and carriages after them drove the committee of the political trades unions the members of it attired in green sashes and scarves and bearing wands with green flags on their hands next in order were the various members of the corporation aldermen town councillors and officers dressed in their robes of office and cocked hats glittering with chains and furred from head to foot the majority of these gentlemen were in their own carriages into each of which were packed as many of the owner's friends as could find standing room several private vehicles being mixed up through the order of procession then came the private carriages of the lord mayor who was in full dress and then preceded by a confused mass of wand bearers the triumphal chariot itself surrounded by a mob so dense that it was with great difficulty that the six splendid dappled greys could force the cumbrous vehicle along which every instant seemed to become a second car of juggernaut and crush some of its adorers more vehicles a few horsemen multitudes of hack cars and pedestrians a tale of old women and little boys followed and so the monster procession after winding its slow length along through the greater part of dublin and causing a total cessation of business in the line of its progress terminated in february appeared in london at the prince's theatre general tom thumb the most popular of modern dwarfs thanks to the advertising qualities of his exhibitor p t barnum the real name of this mite was charles s stratton and he was said to have been born on eleven january eighteen thirty two but this as with all data connected with him must be accepted with caution it was said of him that at his birth he weighed nine pounds two ounces somewhat more than the average weight of a newly born infant at about five months old he weighed fifteen pounds and measured twenty-five inches in height since which time he never increased in stature and at the time of his arrival in england he weighed but fifteen pounds two ounces he had previously been exhibited in new york and the principal cities of america where his miniature palace furniture and equipage excited considerable curiosity when he embarked from new york for england he was escorted to the packet by not less than ten thousand persons on one april he appeared by command before her majesty at buckingham palace when the queen presented him with her own hand with a superb souvenir of the most exquisite handicraft manufactured of mother-of-pearl and mounted with gold and precious stones on one side are the crown and royal initials v r and on the reverse bouquets of flowers in enamel and rubies in addition to this splendid gift her majesty subsequently presented the general with a beautiful gold pencil case with the initials of tom thumb and his coat of arms engraved on the emerald surmounting the case anent this punch was exceedingly satirical her majesty has again commanded the performance of tom thumb the yankee dwarf this indeed was to have been expected we have only to reflect upon the countless acts of patronage towards the arts and sciences had only to remember a few of the numerous personal condescensions of the queen towards men of letters artists and philosophers to be assured that even tom thumb would be welcomed with that graceful cordiality which has heretofore made buckingham palace and windsor castle the homes of poetry and science the minibus curat regina 
Continental monarchs stop short in their royal favours at full-grown authors and artists, but the enthusiasm of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, not content with showering all sorts of favours and rewards upon the literary and artistic spirits of her own country and age, lavishes with prodigal hand most delicate honours upon an American Tom Thumb, whose astounding genius it is to measure, in his boots, five and twenty inches to this how small is victor hugo at the tuileries to this how mean and petty goethe at the court of saxe weimar tom thumb being according to the biography published by his showman barnum the son of a yankee carpenter we should much like to know the general's arms did her majesty before the performance send to learn them that they might be duly engraved or were they, as Matthew's French shoemaker made his little boot, struck off in a moment of enthusiasm? About this time came to us that sweet boon, the polka. Originally a bohemian peasant dance, it was imported into fashionable saloons of Berlin and St. Petersburg. It was at this time the rage in Paris, as the Times observes. The Paris papers are destitute of news, our private letters state that politics are for the moment suspended in public regard by the new and all-absorbing pursuit the polka a dance recently imported from bohemia and which embraces in its qualities the intimacy of the waltz with the vivacity of the irish jig you may conceive how completely is the polka the rage from the fact that the lady of a celebrated ex-minister desiring to figure in it at a soiree dansante monopolized the professor par excellence of that speciality for three hours on wednesday morning last at two hundred francs an hour on its first importation into england it was used as a ballet on the stage with very fancy bohemian costume as we may see in the three following illustrations of mademoiselle carlotta grisi and monsieur perrault dancing their idea of it at her majesty's theatre in eighteen forty four but it soon became a drawing-room dance and it is edifying to know exactly how it was danced then it was found too elaborate and the number of steps had to be reduced in quantity and curtailed in quality but this is the dance as given in the illustrated london news of eleven may the drawing-room polka we are much gratified in being enabled to lay before our readers an accurate description of the véritable or drawing-room polka as danced at almack's and at the halls of the nobility and gentry of this country la polka having appeared amongst us under so many different guises we determined to spare no pains to procure a true description of its danse for which we are indebted to mrs james ray who has been fortunate enough to secure the details from monsieur coralie fees the instructor of the young noblemen and gentry in paris la polka like its predecessors the waltz and galope is a danse à deux couples following each other in the salle de danse commencing at pleasure and adopting of the following figures that which pleases them most at the moment all those anxious to shine at la polka will dance the whole of them returning from time to time by way of rest to the first figure the measure or time is two four but to facilitate our definition we subdivide each measure or bar into one two three four the accent on the two etc to be played not so fast as the galope the steps are two and the following description may in some measure convey them to our readers we commence with the first and most general at the one hop on the right leg lifting or doubling up your left leg at the same moment at the two put your left leg boldly forward on the ground at the three bring your right toe up to your left heel at the four advance your left foot a short step forward now at the one in the next measure or bar of the time hop on the left leg doubling or lifting up your right leg and so on proceeding in this step with your arm encircling your partner's waist round the room this may be termed the first figure figure two 
still adopting the same step with your right arm round your partner's waist and her right hand in your left you place your lady exactly before you and back all round the room your lady pursuing you as shown in the sketch you then reverse this figure and let your partner do the back step whilst you pursue her and at the same time carefully guide her round the room in backing the leg which in figure one you put boldly forward on the ground you now fling boldly backward and are thus enabled to effect your progress round the room figure three with the same step you waltz round the room in other words you perform the galop waltz substituting the polka step as described figure four this is also a waltz with the second step which we now describe as the heel and toe step at the one make a little hop on the right leg dropping your left heel close to your right foot at the two another little hop on the right leg pointing your left toe not forward but as close to your right foot as possible at the three another little hop on the right leg advancing one step forward with the left foot at the four bring up the right foot turning at the same instant and passing your partner over to your left arm from your right arm in your next measure return your lady to your left arm and so on figure five this is termed the back waltz the step adopted in it by yourself and partner is the back step described in figure two and you turn in this waltz exactly the contrary way to that in which you turn in all the other waltzes hence its name in la polka before commencing the figures we have just described there is a short introduction of which we give a sketch consisting of four measures danced thus leading your partner from her seat and giving her her place in the circle and placing themselves vis-a-vis -vis, you take her left hand in your right and make the first step four times first forward then backward forward again then backward taking care to gain ground in the forward steps you then start with the first figure there was a furor about the polka not only in dancing it but there was an absolute mania for naming articles of dress after it ladies wore polka hats polka jackets and polka boots and men had polka ties julien published a new polka about every fortnight and the whole people were polka mad here is a street ballad on the subject julien's grand polka oh sure the world is all run mad the lean the fat the gay the sad all swear such pleasure they never had till they did learn the polka chorus first cock up your right leg so balance on your left great toe stamp your heels and off you go to the original polka oh there's mrs tibbs the tailor's wife with mother briggs is sore at strife as if the first and last of life was but to learn the polka quadrilles and waltzes all give way for julien's polkas bear the sway the chimney sweeps on first of may do in london dance the polka if a pretty girl you chance to meet with sparkling eyes and rosy cheek she'll say young man will have a treat if you can dance the polka a lady who lives in this town went and bought a polka gown and for the same she gave five pound all for to dance the polka but going to the ball one night on the way she got a dreadful fright she tumbled down and ruined quite the gown to dance the polka a frenchman has arrived from france to teach the english how to dance and fill his pocket what's a chance by gammoning the polka professors swarm in every street tis ground on barrel organ sweet and every friend you chance to meet asks if you dance the polka then over fanny elsler came brilliant with transatlantic fame says she i'm german by my name so best i know the polka and the row de do she danced and in short clothes and red heels pranced and as she skipped her red heels glanced in the bohemian polka but now my song is near its close a secret now i will disclose don't tell for it's beneath the rose a humbug is the polka then hey ho humbug france or spain who brings back our old steps again 
when john bull will applaud amain just as he does the polka end of chapter 22「An English Dinner」Consoles at Par「The Running Rain Case」「Other Frauds」«Royal Visitors»「Opening Letters by Government» « Duke of Wellington's Statue» « Barry on the Thames» « Visit of Louis Philippe» « Guano» Queen Opens Royal Exchange, Lord Mayor Hissed. As the length of time between this date and the present writing is great, and our social habits have somewhat changed, it may be interesting to some of my readers to hear a Frenchman's account of an upper-class dinner. It is taken from the Constitutionnel, the organ of Monsieur Thiers. Madeira wine has been out of fashion in England for some time, sherry and port to which are occasionally added bordeaux and champagne rhenish wines and hermitage are now the only wines to be seen on the tables of the rich as for beer the national drink it only makes its appearance at a banquet for remembrance sake and in very small quantity port wine is held in especial favour by the english because while it is more impregnated with alcohol than any other it is at the same time the least irritating and facilitates more than all the rest the important operations of the digestive organs in order however to be possessed of all the requisite qualities it must not only be of the finest growth or have been eight or nine years in the cellar but the regular connoisseurs insist that it must cross the line several times in order to be first-rate five or six servants with powdered wigs in silk stockings and knee-breeches hover about the table the covers are always changed at every successive course and there is no fear of eating off the dirty plate of one's neighbour or passing his knife or fork the sideboard being laden with piles of plates and conveniences of every description after fish which always constitutes the first course the host invites one of his guests to drink a glass of wine with him desiring him to help himself to that which he likes best you take that which is offered you your host then pours out a glass for himself and sends you the bottle by a servant you fill your glass you raise it to your lips with a half bow and drink as much of it as you feel inclined the same ceremony is repeated among the other guests it should be mentioned that if you ask a lady to take wine you always fill her glass before your own but if you invite a gentleman so to do you never fail to help yourself first this custom was formerly very inconvenient to strangers it being then absolutely necessary to empty one's glass at present you need only drink a portion and ladies may satisfy the rules of etiquette by merely moistening their lips after fish come roast meats boiled vegetables and various delicate sauces with which you make your cuisine upon your own plate puddings and game of all sorts follow amongst which there is always to begin with one dish especially appropriate to the season it is to the former article of diet puddings that english children are indebted it is said for their excellent health and their magnificent rosy complexions the cloth is at length removed and the mahogany table shines forth in all its splendour dessert follows consisting of a few sweetmeats or confitures but abounding in fruits from all five parts of the world and the produce of all the four seasons and including superb pineapples portugal grapes almonds red nuts of a delicious flavour dates figs rich juicy oranges etc etc the wine is brought in glass decanters ticketed and placed in silver stands these stands glide along the shining table which is as smooth as ice in the midst of silver or crystal vases filled with fruits etc the host after helping himself to wine pushes about the whole battery of decanters which going the round of the table soon regain their original situation a quarter of an hour elapses when the mistress of the house rises and retires followed by all the ladies it is then that the seance de vin begins 
the subject of conversation soon changes and political questions are discussed the conversation without getting stormy acquires that degree of warmth and animation which a good dinner when one is blessed with a strong head and a good digestion generally inspires hard drinking has generally speaking fallen into desuetude it is only fox hunters and country gentlemen who remain faithful nowadays to that ignoble custom a gentleman who has any self-respect never so far forgets himself as to get tipsy for he would certainly be looked upon with an evil eye by the company if he were to enter the drawing-room with an indistinct articulation or with trembling legs dinner is over about half-past nine the gentlemen then rejoin the ladies to take tea and coffee and the conversation turns as before upon the news of the day on eight april consoles rose to par or one hundred pounds for one hundred pounds stock for the first time for nearly a century the last time they were at a hundred pounds was in seventeen forty nine the year after the peace of aix la chapelle at which period the public debt was rather more than seventy eight million pounds the highest price the three per cents ever rose to previously was in june seventeen thirty seven and again in may seventeen thirty nine when they attained the high price of a hundred and seven pounds in september seventeen ninety seven they fell to forty seven and three eighths which is the lowest price to which they have ever fallen on twenty three may the derby was won by a horse called running rain which was the occasion of an action in the court of exchequer on one july before baron alderson it was alleged that the horse had not been truly described that he was not of the age which qualified him to run for the derby and that he ought not therefore to be deemed the winner of the race colonel peel the owner of orlando the second horse claimed the stakes on the ground that running rain was not the horse represented and mr wood the owner of running rain brought this action against the colonel mr cockburn who conducted the plaintiff's case gave the pedigree of running rain and his whole history among other things mr cockburn mentioned that in october eighteen forty three running rain won a race at newmarket that he was objected to on the score of age but eventually the stewards had decided in his favour the horse was originally the property of mr goodman and mr cockburn said it was because suspicion attached to some transactions of goodman and because certain persons had betted heavily against running rain that opposition was raised against mr wood receiving the stakes he made a severe attack on lord george bentick who he asserted was the real party in the cause witnesses for the plaintiff described the horse at various periods of its career it was of a bay colour with black legs and a little white on the forehead its heels were cracked and in eighteen forty two it broke the skin on one leg which left a scar george hickok a breaker of colts employed to break running rain in october eighteen forty two was cross-examined to this effect i know george dockery the trainer i never said to him damn it this colt has been broken before here is the mark of the pad on his back i showed him the mark but i never said those words or any words to that effect i don't know why i showed him the mark it was not big enough for the mark of a pad and it was not the place for the saddle to make it i told lord george bentick the same the mark of the pad never wears out i recollect being asked in the presence of mr smith what i had there and i recollect answering a four-year-old i have not the slightest doubt of it mr smith struck me for it i did not say afterwards that i had forgotten all about the horsewhipping and that the marks of the pad had worn out i never said either that somebody had behaved very well to me at an early period of the examination of witnesses mr baron alderson expressed a wish that he and the jury should see the horse and mr cockburn said he had no objection on the cross-examination of william smith a training groom residing at epsom it came out that the horse had been smuggled out of the way that it might not be seen by the defendant's agents the judge animadverting on this and on the evident perjury of the witness said it would be better that the horse should be seen by him and other parties 
the solicitor general who appeared for the defendant was anxious that the horse should be seen by veterinary surgeons to which the other side objected maintaining that the mark of mouth by which alone those surgeons could judge of the age of a horse was a fallible criterion on the conclusion of the evidence for the plaintiff the solicitor general in addressing the jury for the defence denounced the case as a gross and scandalous fraud on the part of the plaintiff the case for the defendant was that the horse was not running rain at all but a colt by gladiator out of a dam belonging originally to sir charles ibbotson and that it had the name running rain imposed upon it being originally called maccabeus and having been entered for certain stakes under that designation but his allegations were against goodman not against mr wood the former had entered into a conspiracy with other persons to run horses above the proper age the gladiator colt had been entered for races under the name of maccabeus before goodman purchased him and to run these races while the coat was in training for the derby for which he was entered as running rain goodman hired an irish horse which he disguised as maccabeus though a year older than that horse the gladiator colt the soi disant running rain when he ran for the derby in 1844 was four years old the race being for three-year-old horses after hearing some evidence in support of these statements the case was adjourned till the following day the next day when mr baron alderson took his seat upon the bench a conversation ensued between mr cockburn and the judge respecting the production of the horse mr cockburn asserted that it had been taken away without mr wood's knowledge and thus it was out of his power to produce it he felt it would be vain to strive against the effect which must be felt by the non-production of the horse after the remarks of the learned judge on that point after some conversation however the case proceeded and two witnesses for the defence were examined whose evidence went to prove that running rain was in fact the gladiator colt mr george odell a horse dealer at northampton said he could swear to that fact the colt had two marks on one leg mr baron alderson remarked now if we could see the horse that would prove the case who keeps him away it is quite childish to act in this manner mr cockburn now stated that mr wood was convinced that he had been deceived and gave up the case mr baron alderson then briefly addressed the jury with much warmth and in a most emphatic manner directing them to find a verdict for the defendant observing since the opening of the case a most atrocious fraud has proved to have been practised and i have seen with great regret gentlemen associating themselves with persons much below themselves in station if gentlemen would associate with gentlemen and race with gentlemen we should have no such practices but if gentlemen will condescend to race with the blackguards they must expect to be cheated the jury found for the defendant and the effect of their verdict was that the derby stakes went to orlando and that crinoline should be considered the winner of the two-year-old plate at newmarket run the previous year punch in commenting upon mr baron alderson's remarks says they the gentlemen go among these knaves and swindlers these low-bred ruffians reeking of gin and the stables to make money of them they associate with boors and grooms jew gambling housekeepers boxers and bullies for money's sake to be sure what other motive could bring such dandies into communication with such scoundrels any more than he would willingly incur an infection unless he had some end in view and the noble patrons of the turf have a great end in view that of money this ought to have been sufficient roguery one would think for one race but it was not a horse named rattan was so evidently nobbled that two men connected with it rogers and brougham were warned off all the jockey club's premises and yet another case a horse named leander ran in this race and so injured its leg that it was shot shortly afterwards it was suspected that it was four instead of three years old and on its being exhumed the lower jaw was missing the resurrectionists however cut off the head and veterinary experts confirmed the previous suspicions for this the owners messrs lichtwald were forever disqualified from racing this case occupied much time before the select committee of the house of lords 
The Select Committee on Gaming in the Commons in 1844 report that your committee have some evidence to show that frauds are occasionally committed in horse racing and in betting on the turf but they feel difficulty in suggesting any remedy for this evil more stringent or more likely to be effectual than those already in existence on june one two royal visitors arrived here the emperor of russia and the king of saxony they had to pay the usual penalty of hard labour for a week. In the House of Commons on 14 June, Mr. T. Duncombe presented a petition from W. J. Linton, Joseph Mazzini, and two others, complaining of their letters being opened before delivery, and praying that the House would be pleased to grant without delay a committee to inquire and give immediate redress to the petitioners and prevent the recurrence of so unconstitutional and infamous a practice sir james graham home secretary replied that the house must be aware that from as early a period as the reign of queen anne power existed in the hands of the principal secretary of state to detain and open letters passing through the post office and the house would also be aware that this power had come under the review of parliament at so late a period as the year eighteen thirty seven and by the act of one vic this power of issuing warrants to open and detain letters continued still vested in the secretaries of state he must for fear of creating misapprehension by his answer state that the circumstances mentioned in the petition were to a great extent untrue as to three of the petitioners he doubted if their letters had ever been detained and no warrant as to them had been issued but as to one of the petitioners he had to state that on his responsibility a warrant had been issued as to the correspondence of that person which warrant was no longer in force on two july a committee of secrecy was appointed to inquire into the state of the law in respect to the detaining and opening of letters at the general post office and into the mode under which the authority given for such detaining and opening has been exercised and to report their opinion and observations thereupon to the house the committee met took evidence and duly reported when it being shown that the privilege was not often exercised the total number of warrants issued between seventeen ninety nine and eighteen forty four being only three hundred and seventy two and that of late years the average of warrants had decreased the public were satisfied and the subject dropped chantrey's equestrian statue of the duke of wellington which stands in front of the royal exchange was uncovered amidst much cheering it cost nine thousand pounds besides the medal on twenty three september barry a clown at astley's fulfilled his promise of sailing in a washing tub drawn by geese from vauxhall to westminster he successfully accomplished his voyage and repeated it on october eleven from the red house battersea where now is battersea park to vauxhall on eight october louis philippe the king of the french landed at portsmouth on a visit to the queen he was made a knight of the garter and generally feted and should have returned to france from portsmouth on the twelfth but the sea was too rough and he had to cross from dover instead but even this trip was delayed by a great conflagration at new cross station so that he really did not depart until the thirteenth i meet with the first mention of that eminent fertilizer guano in a commercial point of view in the times of the eighteenth october where it says that on sixteenth were put up for sale at liverpool in lots of ten tons each a hundred and eighty tons of the best african guano but one lot of five tons was sold and that fetched five pounds twelve shillings six pence the next lot was not sold in consequence of the price offered being under that and the whole of the remaining lots were withdrawn there being no probability of the reserved price being realized it was then being fetched from ikabo an island off the southwest coast of africa but it was afterwards procured in large quantities from the chinka islands off the coast of peru on twenty eighth october the queen opened the new royal exchange with great state 
and the Lord Mayor, W. Magney, Esquire, was made a baronet. The reading room at Lloyd's was made into a throne room for the occasion, and a sumptuous déjeuner was served in the underwriter's room. It was a very imposing pageant and pretty sight, but although the exchange was formally opened, no merchants assembled within its quadrangle until the first of the following January. Whilst on matters civic I must mention the very rare fact that Sir William Magnay's successor in the office of Lord Mayor, Mr. Alderman Gibbs, being hooted and yelled at on 9 November, whilst going to Westminster and returning thence. He had been churchwarden at St. Stephen's Walbrook, and the popular mind was imbued with the idea that something was wrong with his accounts, so they virtuously insulted him. He had a hard time enough of it both by land and water when going. What his returning was is best told by a contemporary. The ceremony within the Court of Exchequer having terminated similar uproarious shouts to those which had hailed the arrival of the new Lord Mayor, now marked his embarkation for the city, and in his passage down the Thames, with but here and there a solitary exception, the civic barge was the target of repeated volleys of yells and groans levelled by no unskilful or ineffective voices at it from the banks and bridges of the river. The landing at Blackfriars was attended with a more concentrated attack of public execration, for there an immense multitude was wedged together, anxious to be spectators of the scene, though not inactive ones. On the procession passed amid the continued manifestations of public disapprobation of the present and respect for the retiring Lord Mayor many interrogations of a searching nature were repeatedly bawled forth not that they could reach the right honourable ear but they were exercises in that peculiar art styled talking at folks the same description must apply to ludgate hill st paul's churchyard and cheapside in which place some merriment was created by a party chanting in appropriate style o alderman gibbs pray dub up the dibs it was somewhat after four o'clock when the cortege arrived at the bottom of king street where immediately before guildhall yard about two thousand persons had collected and others pressing out of the several streets caused a dense mass to be formed this was the place where a parting salutation was to be presented to the new lord mayor by his pitiless persecutors and a very good view of the scene was attainable from an upper window at the western angle of gresham street Hearty and continued cheering announced the progress of Sir William Magnay, but as soon as the state coach with the new Lord Mayor arrived, the yells and groans which broke forth were perfectly stunning. Never was the manner in which the two Lord Mayors had been received throughout the day marked with stronger contrast. The accumulation of carriages in Guildhall Yard caused the detention of the state coach for some minutes, during which a real tempest of execration was poured forth upon the unfortunate gentleman, and many persons did not hesitate to testify their dislike to him in a manner to be condemned by spitting at the carriage, their distance from which, however, defeated their intention. In truth, Mr. Gibbs had to endure a perpetual and pitiless storm of hisses, yells, groans, jibes, sneers, and jeers and at every stoppage where the crowd was in close proximity to his carriage unusually furious outbursts of indignation broke forth yet no missile was thrown during any portion of the day End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of gossip in the first decade of victoria's reign by john ashton this librivox recording is in the public domain Chapter Twenty Four: Murder by Towel, Curious Story, King William the Fourth Statue, Visits by the Queen, a Testimonial to Rowland Hill, Breaking the Portland Vase, Sad End of William Austin, Tale of Van Amburgh Stud, Hungerford Suspension Bridge, Accident at Yarmouth, An Excise Case, Beginning of the Railway Mania, Sailing of Sir J. Franklin. This year begins badly with a murder which i should not chronicle were it not that it was the first case in which the electric telegraph lent its services for the detection of a crime 
a man named john towel a member of the society of friends and who occupied a decent position in life poisoned a poor woman at salt hill a quaker who seemed much confused had been met close by her house and he went by train from slough to paddington suspicion being aroused a message was sent from slough giving a description of him and asking that he should be shadowed on his arrival this was done and next day he was arrested he was tried found guilty and duly executed the case at the time created an immense sensation mainly because the villain was a member of the society of friends apropos of this the observer on twenty three march is responsible for the following the murder towel the following strange statement has been made by a person who is a quaker living near berkhamsted and who is acquainted with towel about a year ago the stillness and decorum of the quakers meeting at berkhamsted at which towel attended was disturbed by one of the male members who suddenly rose from his seat and exclaimed with frantic earnestness that there was then present a person who was at that very moment meditating a most fearful crime his conviction was so strong that he passionately besought this individual whoever he might be to reflect upon the wickedness of his intention and to implore his maker's pardon for his murderous thoughts as may be imagined the friends were thrown into great consternation by this strange and impetuous appeal and the meeting broke up in alarm and confusion towel was present at the time Early in January the statue of King William the Fourth by Samuel Nixon was placed on its pedestal fronting London Bridge, but as far as I know there was no public ceremony at its inauguration, for the Times of 1 February says that workmen are now actively employed in cleansing down the colossal figure of King William the Fourth, preparatory to the hoarding being removed and the statue thrown open to the view of the public the base will present a very novel and pleasing appearance it being ornamented with numerous naval trophies the four cross footpaths leading to the figure will be lighted by four gas lamps on massive granite pillars in a few days the whole work will be completed when it will be inspected by her majesty the queen dowager and his royal highness prince albert those illustrious personages having intimated their desire to view it when finished on fifteen january the queen paid a visit to the duke of buckingham at stowe and the magnificence of her reception had much to do with the financial collapse of the too generous duke on leaving stowe she went to strathfield's eye to stay with the duke of wellington it was on this occasion that the old duke gave a lesson to the gentlemen of the press which the interviewers of our times might well take to heart field marshal of the duke of wellington presents his compliments to mr blank and begs to say he does not see what his house at strathfield's eye has to do with the public press on twenty one january a national testimonial was presented to rowland hill for his labours in connection with the introduction of the penny post and mr larpent the chairman of the city of london mercantile committee on postage handed him a cheque for ten thousand pounds which handsome sum had been raised by a public subscription which was not confined to the mercantile community alone persons of every rank and of both sexes contributing amounts varying from large sums to a few pence just before the closing of the british museum at four p m on seven february a crash was heard and the famous barberini or portland vase was found in pieces on the floor a man named lloyd in a fit of delirium produced by drink had smashed it out of pure wantonness the vase was valued at a thousand pounds by the museum authorities but of course that sum was purely nominal as the vase was unique it was deposited in the british museum in the year eighteen ten by the duke of portland and was considered as his property hence the name the portland vase it was found about the middle of the sixteenth century about two and a half miles from rome on the road leading from frascati at the time of its discovery it was enclosed in a marble sarcophagus within a sepulchral chamber under the mount called monte di grano the material of which it is made is glass the body being of a beautiful transparent dark blue enriched with figures in relief of opaque white glass for more than two centuries it was the principal object of admiration in the barberini palace 
it came into the possession of sir william hamilton from whom it was purchased by the duchess of portland on eleven february the delinquent was brought before mr jardine at bow street and the museum authorities electing to prosecute him for the minor offence of breaking the glass case which held the vase and which was under the value of five pounds he was convicted of that offence and sentenced to pay three pounds or two months hard labour in the house of correction he could not pay and was committed to prison in default but on thirteen february some one paid the money and the man was released an employee of the british museum named doubleday undertook and effected the restoration of the vase and it may now be seen in the gold room of the british museum but alas all the king's horses and all the king's men can never make it as it was wedgwood feebly reproduced it in ceramic ware copies of which are now worth two hundred pounds each and one copy if not more was made in silver i come across a curious paragraph in the morning post of march thirteen william austin this person whose name must be familiar to all who have had any acquaintance with the history of the parliamentary proceedings in the case of the late queen caroline or the eventful life of that unhappy princess arrived in london last week from milan where he has been residing for several years for the most part in a state of fatuity the inmate of a lunatic asylum we understand that he has been removed to this country through the intervention of the british government under an authority from the lord chancellor in whose care his person and some considerable property left to him by the late queen have been placed by certain proceedings on the part of his relations he was conveyed hither from milan under the charge of a medical and two other attendants and immediately on his arrival was visited by two london physicians who after an interview with him of some duration at the hotel where he stopped signed the necessary certificate for his detention in a private asylum where he now remains austin is a very good-looking man apparently about forty years of age and though beyond doubt mentally enfeebled has no betrayal of such imbecility in the expression of his face he has been in his present unfortunate condition since the year eighteen thirty and for a great part of that time he has maintained an immovable taciturnity no ingenuity has been able to extract a syllable from him he answers no questions nor asks any enters into no conversation and even during the whole journey from milan to london he never spoke a word to his attendants or any one else neither could the medical gentlemen who waited upon him here induce him to reply to any of their inquiries and no doubt this fact of itself formed no inconsiderable ingredient in the judgment at which they arrived the unhappy man is extremely docile has no disposition to violence and readily understands and obeys any signs made to him van amberg's stud lions etc were sold at manchester on seventeen march and fetched high prices a fine black-maned lion three hundred and fifty pounds another six years old three hundred and ten pounds two lion cubs eight months old male and female sold the one for twelve pounds ten shillings the other for thirty five pounds an elephant realized seven hundred and fifty pounds and a giraffe four hundred pounds hungerford suspension bridge the first of its kind over the thames was opened on one may and although a toll was demanded it was calculated that before dusk some twenty five thousand persons had crossed from one side of the thames to the other it was taken down in july eighteen sixty two to make room for the charing cross railway bridge it was transferred to clifton and there opened on eight december eighteen sixty four and it now spans the avon on the next day two may a terrible accident occurred at the suspension bridge at great yarmouth a clown was to emulate barry's folly and cross the river in a washing tub drawn by geese and thousands of people assembled to see him of whom a great number accounts vary from three hundred to six hundred containing very many children were on the bridge some of the suspension rods snapped and the crowd fell into the water every assistance was rendered but the number of recovered dead bodies nearly all children or young persons was seventy-seven and many are supposed to have been swept away by the current 
On the 2nd of May, the famous excise trial at Bar, i.e. before twelve judges, the Attorney General versus Smith, came to an end after lasting eight days. Mr. George Smith was a distiller in a large way of business at Whitechapel, and the premises of his brother James, who was a rectifier, adjoined his. The law forbids the junction of the businesses of distilling and rectifying, or any communication between premises carrying on such businesses, and in this case it was presumed that all spirit would be conveyed from one to the other by means of the highway but the contention of the prosecution was that the excise officers finding a great deficiency in the spirits ostensibly produced as compared with the wash had detected holes in a large receiver and found moreover that they could themselves convey spirits from the distillery to the rectifying house through pipes underground which were mixed up with those which supplied water and so escaped detection this the defendants denied and brought forward evidence that the pipes were obsolete and disused in the end the verdict of the jury was we find for the crown but we are anxious to express our opinion that there has not been any evidence adduced before us which shows that the pipe has been fraudulently used by the defendant the amount of damages claimed by the crown was a hundred and fifty thousand pounds but by agreement this was reduced to seventy six thousand pounds and finally after an appeal from mr smith the government were content with a check for ten thousand pounds about this time commenced what is well termed the railway mania or rather public attention was particularly called to it as it was becoming a crying scandal so much so that it attracted the notice of the legislature and if we look at a return to the order of the honourable the house of commons dated eighth april eighteen forty five for an alphabetical list of the names descriptions and places of abode of all persons subscribing to the amount of two thousand pounds and upwards to any railway subscription contract deposited in the private bill office during the present session of parliament we shall see that amongst the names will be found many of the leading nobility large manufacturing firms names well known in commerce and literature mingled together in a most heterogeneous manner the same column shows a combination of peers and printers vicars and vice-admirals spinsters and half-pay officers members of parliament and special pleaders professors and cotton spinners gentlemen's cooks and k c s attorneys clerks and college scouts waiters at lloyd's relieving officers and excise men editors and engineers barristers and butchers catholic priests and coachmen dairymen and dyers braziers bankers beer sellers and butlers domestic servants footmen and mail guards and almost every calling under the sun and these it must be remembered were subscribers for two thousand pounds and upwards those who put down their names for less were supposed to be holders of twenty one thousand three hundred and eighty six pounds six shillings four pence in stock of course punch could not overlook this mania for speculation and we find the following in the number for thirty one may the night was stormy and dark the town was shut up in sleep only those were abroad who were out on a lark or those who'd no beds to keep i passed through the lonely street the wind did sing and blow i could hear the policeman's feet clapping to and fro there stood a potato man in the midst of all the wet he stood with his tato can in the lonely haymarket two gents of dismal mien and dank and greasy rags came out of a shop for gin swaggering over the flags swaggering over the stones these shabby bucks did walk and i went and followed these needy ones and listened to their talk was i sober or awake could i believe my ears those dismal beggars spake of nothing but railroad shares i wondered more and more says one good friend of mine how many shares have you wrote for in the diddlesex junction line i wrote for twenty says jim but they wouldn't give me one his comrade straight rebuked him for the folly he had done. Oh, Jim, you are unawares of the ways of this bad town. I always write for five hundred shares, and then they put me down. And yet you got no shares, said Jim, for all your boast. I would ha wrote, says Jack, but where was the penny to pay the post? 
I lost, for I couldn't pay that first instalment up. But here's Tater smoking hot, I say. Let's stop, my boy, and sup. And at this simple feast, the while they did regale, I drew each ragged capitalist down on my left thumb nail. Their talk did me perplex, all night I tumbled and tossed, and I thought of railroad specs, and how money was won and lost. Bless railroads everywhere, I said, and the world's advanced. Bless every railroad share in Italy, Ireland, France, for never a beggar need now despair, and every rogue has a chance. And yet another extract. Who does not remember Thackeray's diary of C. James de la Pluche, Esquire, but few know how the idea was started. It was by W. M. T. himself in Punch on August 2nd. A Lucky Speculator Considerable sensation has been excited in the upper and lower circles in the West End by a startling piece of good fortune which has befallen James Plush Esquire, lately footman in a respected family in Berkeley Square. One day last week, Mr. James waited upon his master, who is a banker in the city, and after a little blushing and hesitation, said he had saved a little money in service and was anxious to retire and invest his savings to advantage. His master, we believe we may mention without offending delicacy, the well-known name of Sir George Flimsey of the firm of Flimsey, Diddler & Flash, smilingly asked Mr. James what was the amount of his savings, wondering considerably how, out of an income of thirty guineas, the main part of which he spent in bouquets, silk stockings, and perfumery, Mr. Plush could have managed to lay by anything. Mr. Plush, with some hesitation, said he had been speculating in railroads, and stated his winnings to have been thirty thousand pounds. He had commenced his speculations with twenty borrowed from a fellow-servant. He had dated his letters from the house in Berkeley Square, and humbly begged pardon of his master for not having instructed the railway secretaries, who answered the applications, to apply at the area bell. Sir George, who was at breakfast, instantly arose and shook Mr. P. by the hand. Lady Flimsey begged him to be seated and partake of the breakfast which he had laid on the table, and has subsequently invited him to her grand déjeuner at Richmond, where it was observed that Miss Emily Flimsey, her beautiful and accomplished seventh daughter, paid the lucky gentleman marked attention. We hear it stated that Mr. P. is of very ancient family, Hugo de la Pluche, came over with the conqueror, and the new brougham which he has started bears the ancient coat of his race. He has taken apartments at the Albany and is a director of 33 railroads. He purposes to stand for Parliament at the next general election on decidedly conservative principles, which have always been the politics of his family. Report says that even in his humble capacity, Miss Emily Flemsey had remarked his high demeanour. Well, none but the brave, say we, deserve the fair this we may call the commencement of the mania in their proper places will be noticed its culmination and collapse on eighteen may sailed from Grenite the two arctic discovery ships the erebus and terror under the command of sir john franklin whose instructions were to push to the westward without loss of time in the latitude of about seventy-four and a quarter degrees till you have reached the longitude of that portion of land on which cape walker is situated or about ninety eight degrees west from that point we desire that every effort be used to endeavour to penetrate to the southward and westward in a course as direct towards bering straits as the position and strength of the ice or the existence of land at present unknown may admit we direct you to this particular part of the polar sea as affording the best prospect of accomplishing the passage to the pacific they were provisioned for three years, but when, in 1850, Captain Omane discovered on Beachy Island traces of the expedition having spent their first winter there, he found large stacks of preserved meat canisters, which, there is little doubt, contained putrid filth and had been condemned by survey. As nothing was heard of the expedition, another was organized in 1847 to start for search and relief from Hudson's Bay, 
and indeed no one can say that the two exploring vessels were forgotten for from that date till eighteen fifty seven thirty-nine different expeditions were sent to look after them the first to find traces of them was that of captain omenay in eighteen fifty then in april eighteen fifty four dr ray heard from the natives of a party of white men having been seen four winters previously and that their bodies had afterwards been seen from these eskimo ray obtained some silver spoons and other small articles which left no doubt but that they had belonged to the ill-fated expedition but it was the fox yacht which was fitted out by lady franklin and commanded by captain mcclintock which settled the question of their fate early in eighteen fifty nine a boat a few skeletons chronometers clothing instruments watches plate books etc were discovered and towards the end of may a written paper was found which gave news of them up to twenty four april eighteen forty eight and said that sir john franklin died on eleven june eighteen forty seven and the total losses by death in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and fifteen men we start on to-morrow twenty sixth for back's fish river from the eskimo was learned how one of the ships sunk in deep water and the other was wrecked after which they all perished miserably some falling down and dying as they walked as an old woman told captain mcclintock End of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five The Queen's Costume Ball. Copper Coinage of William the Fourth. New Oxford Street Opened. Sale of Napoleon's Relics. Story of Nelson's Coat. Visit of King of the Netherlands. Railway Speculation. Hire of Newspapers. Reverse of Fortune prince albert and his taxes waghorn's overland route the queen gave a costume ball at buckingham palace on sixth june which was a magnificent affair and gave plenty of food for conversation every guest had to appear in a costume appropriate to the period of english history between seventeen forty and seventeen fifty but with the exception of the minuet the dances were modern I have only space for the dresses of the Queen and Prince Albert. Her Majesty's dress was composed of gold tissue, brocaded in coloured flowers, green leaves, and silver, trimmed round the top, bottom, and sides, the upper dress being open in front, with point lace over red ribbon. The dress looped up with red satin ribbons and two large bows, in each of which was a diamond bow and tassel the stomacher was composed of two large diamond bows and a diamond point the sleeves which were tight finished with point lace ruffles and trimmed with red ribbon on the left arm the garter in diamonds and on the right a diamond rosette she wore the blue ribbon and diamond george as usual the under petticoat was of white and silver tissue trimmed with a deep flounce of rich point lace which had belonged to queen charlotte headed by a quilling of red satin ribbon and bows above a narrower flounce of point lace trimmed like the other in each ribbon bow a diamond rosette prince albert wore a suit of the richest crimson velvet of spitalfields manufacture the coat lined with white satin edged throughout with gold and the buttons were of gold on his left breast his royal highness wore a most splendid star of the order of the garter composed of diamonds with the exception of the cross which was formed of rubies the badge of the order was confined at the shoulder by an epaulette composed of large brilliants and a most splendid george was suspended from the ribbon wholly formed of brilliants the prince also wore the insignia of the golden fleece formed of opals and diamonds the garter was set in brilliance and the hilt of his royal highness's sword was covered with diamonds the waistcoat was of white satin richly and elegantly embroidered with gold the buttons being of gold shoe buckles of diamonds hat three-cornered edged with gold lace with handsome diamond ornament in the cockade front 
The Earl of Cardigan could not masquerade as Bayard, but he excited no little attention. He wore the uniform of the 11th Dragoons at Culloden, and with the costume, which became him extremely, he contrived to assume the portentous bearing and the true jackboot stride and swagger. The Morning Chronicle is answerable for the following. For some time past the copper coinage of William the Fourth has been eagerly purchased by persons who are stated to be Jews, and a report has, in consequence, gained ground that gold is contained in it. What reason there may be for this, it is impossible to say, but it is a well-known fact that agents have been at work for the last two months buying up those particular coins in Westminster, and they now fetch double the price of their legal issue. The mania has extended eastward, and two pence for a penny apiece, and a penny for a halfpenny, etc., are now asked for the precious issue. On 9 June, the new street connecting Holborn with Oxford Street, and now called New Oxford Street, was thrown open for carriages. Measures Christie and Manson sold at the Egyptian Hall, Piccadilly, on 23 June, the first portion of the Napoleon Museum collected by Mrs. Sainsbury, and which had long been on exhibition. The prices fetched were ridiculously low, as the following examples will show. Among the bronzes, an infantine bust of the King of Rome, formerly in the possession of Josephine at Malmaison, cost twenty guineas, sold for one pound ten shillings. A drawing in sepia by Debray of Napoleon visiting the wounded on the field after the Battle of Elio, five pounds five shillings. The pictures illustrative of the principal events in the life of Napoleon were almost given away, the highest price obtained being twelve pounds for one by the great French painter David of Napoleon, with the crown raised in both his hands to place on the head of Josephine at the coronation in Notre Dame. Twenty beautiful enamels by Leonard of Napoleon, nay, Berthier, Junot, joseph lucien louis and jerome bonaparte murat caroline the youngest sister of napoleon cardinal fesch marie louise etc fetched but seventy six pounds and on the other day's sales the lots went for far under their value my readers may possibly remember how on eight december nineteen hundred a number of nelson relics in the painted hall at greenwich hospital were stolen during the night by a burglar who escaped and may like to know the story of nelson's coat the times of nine july copies the following from the spectator an interesting relic of nelson has been discovered and some interest also attaches to the manner in which it has been secured to the nation sir harris nicholas in his laborious researches for editing the hero's dispatches had satisfied himself that the coat and waistcoat which nelson wore when he fell at trafalgar were carefully preserved in pursuance of the admiral's directions they were given with several other things by sir thomas hardy his captain to lady hamilton by her they were transferred under peculiar circumstances to a late alderman of london and they remained in the possession of the alderman's widow the lady is not rich and she asked a hundred and fifty pounds for the relic this sum being beyond his own means sir harris determined to raise it by subscription in order that the coat and waistcoat might be deposited like the coat which nelson wore at the battle of the nile in greenwich hospital with that view he put the proposition in writing and had it printed as a circular before issuing this circular however he sent a copy to prince albert who immediately desired that the purchase might be made for himself as he should feel pride and pleasure in presenting the precious memorials to greenwich hospital sir harris nicholas took them to the royal purchaser on wednesday and we understand that the prince manifested a very fine feeling on the occasion there is kind and generous wisdom in this act, for nothing could so help to identify the Queen's husband with the British people as such little tributes to their maritime pride. The code is thus described in Sir Harris Nicholas's circular, and it will be seen that it has an historic value. 
The coat is the undress uniform of a vice admiral, lined with white silk, with lace on the cuffs and epaulets. Four stars, of the Order of the Bath, St. Ferdinand and Merritt, the Crescent and St. Joachim, are sewn on the left breast, as Nelson habitually wore them, which disproves the story that he purposely adorned himself with his decorations on going into battle. The course of the fatal ball is shown by a hole over the left shoulder, and part of the epaulette is torn away, which agrees with Dr. Sir William Beatty's account of Lord Nelson's death, and with the fact that pieces of the bullion and pad of the epaulette adhered to the ball, which is now in Her Majesty's possession. The coat and waistcoat are stained in several places with the hero's blood. Further confirmatory evidence is given in the globe, copied into the Times of 22 July. It will scarcely be believed that the coat of the great naval hero, together with his cocked hat and an immense quantity of his property, was as it were mortgaged for the sum of a hundred and twenty pounds, yet such was the fact. The late alderman Jonathan Joshua Smith was executor of Lord Nelson with Lady Hamilton, and prior to his death goods sufficient to fill six crates, amongst which were the coat, hat, breeches, etc., were placed in the town hall Southwark under the care of Mr. Kinsey, the chief officer, and who now attends the alderman at the Central Criminal Court. Kinsey was Alderman Smith's confidential servant for a number of years, and to whom a hundred and twenty pounds was owing at his master's death. Application was made to the Court of Aldermen by some members of the Nelson family for the restitution of the property, and after a long discussion, Alderman Lucas consented to act as arbitrator between the family and Kinsey, and thirty pounds was paid to the latter in satisfaction of his claim, upon which the things were repacked and sent to Mrs. Smith at Heron Court, Richmond, in whose possession they remained until the purchase of the coat was made by Prince Albert. The King of the Netherlands paid the Queen a visit on 24 July, and the good man must have thought well of us, inasmuch as he was very much let do as he liked. In London he stopped at Myvert's Hotel, went to the opera, paid a few visits, was a guest of the Duke of Richmond for Goodwood Races, was made a field marshal, held a review in Hyde Park, and went back again. A far lighter sentence than is usually passed on royalty when visiting this country. We now find the inflation of railway speculation attracting attention, and in the Times of August 1 is a letter, a column in length, of which I give the following extract, referring to the inquiry into the Dublin and Galway Railway. The next case is that of letters addressed to 1 Park Place, Devonshire Street, Mile End Road. So great is the number of letters delivered here that additional assistance has been given in the duty. Upwards of a thousand letters have been delivered here within nine months. Only last week a hundred and twenty were taken in on one day, of which at one time no less than sixteen and at another thirty letters were delivered. This number one park place is up an obscure court, consisting of three small houses of about five and six rent per week. Number one is occupied by a man and woman, and the next door by their daughter. The proceedings of these persons have been closely watched. Directly a packet of letters has been received in the morning, off starts the old man and woman, and sometimes the daughter, to the places appointed to meet the receiver. On the first occasion, the old woman who had received sixteen letters evidently wanted to deposit her treasure at Crosby Hall Chambers, for opposite to them she halted, carefully looking about her, but unfortunately she found she was watched, and escaping through the excise office, hid herself somewhere till her pursuer lost her. The next morning another packet was received, with which the old man was entrusted. He started immediately, and after a most circuitous route, to avoid detection as to where he deposited his treasure, he was seen to enter the King's Arms Tavern, Bishopsgate Churchyard, where he was seen to deliver his dispatches to a smart, dapper Jew, well known, who, after a few moments' deliberation, left the house and was speedily joined by several confederates at the top of the churchyard, 
who, after dividing the letters, dispersed as instantaneously as can be imagined. The next day it became necessary to augment the detective force, for the old people became more wary. The old man went out before post-time, and the daughter was selected as the messenger with dispatches. She was fleet of foot, but she had been carefully identified, therefore that did not avail her much, as the detective force was divided and stationed at such places as were likely to succeed. She took a most circuitous route, but eventually found herself opposite the auction mart, evidently looking out anxiously for someone. She saw she was watched, and away she started, and after a long round found shelter at Maidenhead Court, Aldergate Street, in a little smith's shop, which turned out to belong to the identical party who resides at Number 1 Park Place, where the letters were first delivered. Here the pursuit was given up. No further attempt to trace the receiver was made, the inquiry before the select committee coming on but sufficient is shown to exhibit the system existing to this hour. How it may be asked do they procure the signatures to the deed, one party holding so many letters of allotment. The system is this. One party signs the deed as often as disguise will shield him from discovery. Then the practice is resorted to of procuring persons from fifteen years to sixty, to accompany the holder of the banker's receipt to the railway office to sign the deed in such name as he may direct for which when done he receives remuneration varying from one shilling to ten according to the premium the script may bear in the market there were several police cases as to writing and forging these bogus names and prudent people were beginning to look shy at railway scrip here is a case which we can hardly understand nowadays. As long as newspapers were stamped, it was a misdemeanor to allow anyone to read them unless they purchased them, as it was considered a fraud upon the revenue. On 23 August, at the Court of Requests, Kingsgate Street, a case came before the commissioners for adjudication, in which a news vendor summoned a person for a small sum for reading the various newspapers the plaintiff in stating the case said the defendant had been in the habit of seeing the papers daily for which a penny a day was charged and the present proceedings were taken to recover a balance due on that account the commissioner said that he could not recover as he had been guilty of a gross fraud upon the stamp office in letting newspapers out for hire the plaintiff but he was in the habit of coming to my shop and seeing them the commissioner that don't matter it is a fraud upon the stamp office and you render yourself liable to an information being laid against you for it here is a little anecdote chronicled in the annual register six september reverse of fortune edward riley living with his family in hadley street burton crescent having been proved next of kin to major-general riley who recently died at Madras, leaving property to the amount of fifty thousand pounds, to the whole of which he has become entitled, has greatly amused the neighbourhood by his conduct. From having been but a workman in the dust-yard in Maiden Lane, he has now become a man of independence. Some days after his sudden acquisition of wealth, he called in his cab on a tailor in Seymour Street, and taking him to the dust-yard desired him to measure the whole of the men in the yard for a suit of clothes which being accomplished he ordered them to go to a bootmaker where they were all served on the following sunday he ordered a butcher to supply each of them with a joint of meat riley has taken a house in argyle square and upon entering it purposes to give a dinner to all the dustmen in london and illuminate the front of his house we have seen, in 1843, Punch's idea of Prince Albert as a farmer, and we next hear of him, in connection with this business, as refusing to pay parish rates for the Flemish farm. So, at a vestry meeting held at Windsor on 18 September, the subject was brought forward. It appeared that the estimated rental of the property was £450, and that the last rate at eight pence in the pound amounting to £15 had not been paid. 
it was stated that the prince had refused to pay the rates on two grounds first that he had no beneficial occupation and secondly that the property belonged to the queen the reply to this was that the prince certainly had a beneficial occupation in the farm for the two prize oxen sold by him last year at seventy pounds and eighty pounds were fatted on this farm to say nothing of the crops and agricultural produce from which his royal highness received great profits and it was thought there was no reason why he should be let off and the poorer farmers made to pay the rates it was settled that the collectors should make application for the arrears amounting to over two hundred pounds punch drew a harrowing picture of the brokers being put into windsor castle and of a paragraph which might appear in the court circular yesterday her gracious majesty visited prince albert at her own bench but matters did not go so far for on fourteen january next following the prince vouchsafed an answer to the vestry in which he denied his liability in toto acting on the advice of the attorney and solicitor-general and sir thomas wilde and after crushing the poor vestry the letter winds up thus and his royal highness feels himself at liberty to take the course which is most satisfactory to his own feelings and to pay as a voluntary contribution a sum equal to the rate which would have been annually due had the legal liability of his royal highness been established it is also his royal highness's intention that the payment of the sum referred to should commence from the year eighteen forty one and so it has continued to the present day if we may credit the authority quoted in the accompanying cutting from the globe of eight june nineteen o one how the king pays taxes it is not generally known says the freelance that the king pays taxes under protest that is to say his majesty like queen victoria claims to be exempt from impost and yet is willing to contribute without prejudice to the rates for instance part of the windsor farmland lies within the radius of the borough the municipal authority issues demand notes for the rates the royal officials respond by paying a sum just under the amount requested and the collector is satisfied there is no question of going to law for how can the king be summoned in his own courts on thirty one october lieutenant waghorn practically demonstrated the feasibility of his overland route to india the regular mail and his express arrived at suez by the same steamer on nineteen october the express was given to a man on a dromedary who stopping nowhere entered alexandria on the twentieth the express was delivered to mr waghorn who started at eleven o'clock he had been waiting on board an austrian steamer which had remained in quarantine so that he arrived at trieste in free pratique he landed however at divina twelve miles nearer london than trieste and hurried through austria prussia baden and bavaria with a passport ready visaed by the representatives of those countries he reached Mannheim in eighty-four hours, proceeded by a steamer to Cologne, thence by special train to Ostend, by boat to Dover, to London by railway, and arrived at four-thirty in the morning of the thirty-first. The news from India thus brought was published in all the London papers, which were in Paris before the mail from Marseille was on its way to London. End of chapter twenty-five Chapter Twenty Six of Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six: The Railway Mania, Deposit of Plans. The accompanying illustration from Punch, eighteen October, justly holds up to ridicule the railway mania, which might then be said to have been at its height. It is called the March of Speculation this is the young gent as takes my business ma'am i'm a-goin into the railway director line myself as a proof of this madness see this paragraph 
October 25, during the past week there were announced in three newspapers 89 new schemes with a capital of £84,055,000. During the month there were 357 new schemes announced with an aggregate capital of £332,000,000. On 17 November, the Times published a table of all the railway companies registered up to the 31st October, numbering 1,428 and involving an outlay of 701,243,208 pounds. Take away, it said, 140 million pounds for railways completed or in progress, exclude all the most extravagant schemes and divide the remainder by ten, can we add from our present resources even a tenth of the vast remainder? Can we add fifty million pounds to the railway speculations we are irretrievably embarked in? We cannot, without the most ruinous, universal, and desperate confusion. Here is a parody on the situation, 1 November. There was a sound that ceased not day or night of speculation, london gathered then unwanted crowds and moved by promise bright to capel court rushed women boys and men all seeking railway shares and scrip and when the market rose how many a lad could tell with joyous glance and eyes that spake again twas e'en more lucrative than marrying well when hark that warning voice strikes like a rising knell nay it is nothing empty as the wind but a bear whispers down throckmorton street wild enterprise shall still be unconfined no rest for us when rising premiums greet the morn to pour their treasures at our feet when hark that solemn sound is heard once more the gathering bears its echoes yet repeat tis but too true is now the general roar the bank has raised her rate as she has done before and then and there were hurrying to and fro and anxious thoughts and signs of sad distress faces all pale that but an hour ago smiled at the thought of their own craftiness and there were sudden partings such as press the coins from hungry pockets mutual sighs of brokers and their clients who can guess how many a stag already panting flies when upon times so bright such awful panics rise mr francis in his history of the english railway says the daily press was thoroughly deluged with advertisements double sheets did not supply space enough for them double doubles were resorted to and then frequently insertions were delayed it has been estimated that the receipts of the leading journals averaged at one period twelve thousand pounds and fourteen thousand pounds a week from this source the railway papers on some occasions contained advertisements that must have netted seven hundred pounds to eight hundred pounds on each publication the printer the lithographer and the stationer with the preparation of prospectuses the execution of maps and the supply of other requisites also made a considerable harvest the leading engineers were necessarily at a great premium mr brunel was said to be connected with fourteen lines mr robert stevenson with thirty-four mr locke with thirty-one mr rastrick with seventeen and other engineers with one hundred and thirteen the novelist has appropriated this peculiar portion of commercial history and describing it says gravely and graphically a colony of solicitors engineers and seedy accountants settled in the purlieu of threadneedle street every town and parish in the kingdom blazed out in zinc plates over the doorways from the cellar to the roof every fragment of a room held its committee the darkest cupboard on the stairs contained a secretary or a clerk men who were never seen east of temple bar before or since were now as familiar to the pavement of morgate street as the stockbrokers footnote from Morgate Street, 83 prospectuses demanding £90,175,000 were sent out. Gresham Street issued 20, requiring £17,580,000. End note. Ladies of title, lords, members of parliament, and fashionable loungers thronged the noisy passages and were jostled by adventurers, by gamblers, rogues, and impostors 
the advantages of competition were pointed out with the choicest phraseology lines which passed by barren districts and by waste heaths the termini of which were in uninhabitable places reached a high premium the shares of one company rose two thousand four hundred per cent everything was to pay a large dividend everything was to yield a large profit one railway was to cross the entire principality without a single curve the shares of another were issued the company formed and the directors appointed with only the terminal point surveyed in the ely railway not one person connected with the country through which it was to pass subscribed the title deed the engineers who were examined in favour of particular lines promised all and everything in their evidence it was humorously said of them they plunge through the bowels of mountains they undertake to drain lakes they bridge valleys with viaducts their steepest gradients are gentle undulations their curves are lines of beauty they interrupt no traffic they touch no prejudice labour of all kinds increased in demand the price of iron rose from sixty-eight shillings to one hundred and twenty per ton money remained abundant promoters received their tens and twenties of thousands rumours of sudden fortunes were very plentiful estates were purchased by those who were content with their gains and to crown the whole a grave report was circulated that northumberland house with its princely reminiscences and palatial grandeur was to be bought by the southwestern many of the railways attained prices which staggered reasonable men the more worthless the article the greater seemed the struggle to obtain it premiums of five pounds and six pounds were matters of course even where there were four or five competitors for the road one company which contained a clause to lease it at three and a half per cent for nine hundred and ninety nine years rose to twenty premiums so mad were the many to speculate every branch of commerce participated in the advantages of an increased circulation the chief articles of trade met with large returns profits were regular and all luxuries which suited an affluent community procured an augmented sale banking credit remained facile interest still kept low money speaking as they of the city speak could be had for next to nothing it was advanced on everything which bore a value whether readily convertible or not bill brokers would only allow one and a half per cent for cash and what is one and a half to men who revelled in the thought of two hundred the exchanges remained remarkably steady the employment of the labourer on the new lines of the operative in the factory of the skilled artisan in the workshop of the clerk at the desk tended to add to the delusive feeling and was one of the forms in which for a time the population was benefited but when the strength of the kingdom is wasted in gambling temporary indeed is the good compared with the cost many whose money was safely invested sold at any price to enter the share market servants withdrew their hoards from the savings banks the tradesman crippled his business the legitimate love of money became a fierce lust the peer came from his club to his brokers the clergyman came from his pulpit to the mart the country gentleman forsook the calmness of his rural domain for the feverish excitement of threadneedle street voluptuous tastes were indulged in by those who were previously starving the new men vied with the old in the luxurious adornments of their houses every one smiled with contentment every face wore a pleased expression some who by virtue of their unabashed impudence became provisional committeemen supported the dignity of their position in a style which raised the mirth of many and moved the envy of more trustees who had no money of their own or who had lost it used that which was confided to them brothers speculated with the money of sisters sons gambled with the money of their widowed mothers children risked their patrimony and it is no exaggeration to say that the funds of hundreds were surreptitiously endangered by those in whose control they were placed but railways had been projected and in order to carry them through the plans must by law be deposited with the board of trade before or on thirty november and on this occasion there was a scene which is very well told in the annual register 
an extraordinary scene occurred at the office of the railway department of the board of trade on this day sunday thirty november being the last day on which the plans of the new projects could be deposited with the railway board in order to enable bills to authorize them to be brought before parliament in compliance with the standing orders last year the number of projects in respect of which plans were lodged with the board of trade was two hundred and forty eight the number this year is stated to be eight hundred and fifteen the projectors of the scotch lines were mostly in advance and had their plans duly lodged on saturday the irish projectors too and the old established companies seeking powers to construct branches were among the more punctual but upwards of six hundred plans remained to be deposited towards the last the utmost exertions were made to forward them the efforts of the lithographic draughtsmen and printers in london were excessive people remained at work night after night snatching a hasty repose for a couple of hours on lockers benches or the floor some found it impossible to execute their contracts others did their work imperfectly one of the most eminent was compelled to bring over four hundred lithographers from belgium and failed nevertheless with this reinforcement in completing some of his plans post horses and express trains to bring to town plans prepared in the country were sought in all parts horses were engaged days before and kept by persons specially appointed under lock and key some railway companies exercised their power of refusing express trains for rival projects and clerks were obliged to make sudden and embarrassing changes of route in order to travel by less hostile ways a large establishment of clerks were in attendance to register the deposits and this arrangement went on very well until eleven o'clock when the delivery grew so rapid that the clerks were quite unable to keep pace with the arrivals the entrance hall soon became inconveniently crowded considerable anxiety being expressed lest twelve o'clock should arrive ere the requisite formality should have been gone through the anxiety was allayed by the assurance that admission into the hall before that hour would be sufficient to warrant the reception of the documents as the clock struck twelve the doors of the office were about to be closed when a gentleman with the plans of one of the surrey railways arrived and with the greatest difficulty succeeded in obtaining admission a lull of a few minutes here occurred but just before the expiration of the first quarter of an hour a post-chaise with reeking horses drove up in hot haste to the entrance in a moment its occupants three gentlemen alighted and rushed down the passage towards the office door each bearing a plan of brobdenagian dimensions on reaching the door and finding it closed the countenances of all drooped but one of them more valorous than the rest and prompted by the bystanders gave a loud pull at the bell it was answered by inspector otway who informed the ringer it was now too late and that his plans could not be received the agents did not wait for the conclusion of the unpleasant communication but took advantage of the door being opened and threw in their papers which broke the passage lamp in their fall they were thrown back into the street when the door was again opened again went in the plans only to meet a similar fate in the whole upwards of six hundred plans were duly deposited End of chapter twenty six Chapter Twenty Seven of A Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Seven: Collapse of the Railway Mania, Sheriff's Officers, Hudson, the Railway King, First Ethiopian Serenaders, the Nigger Minstrel Craze, Commencement of Irish Famine, the Battle of the Ganges, Railway Surveyors suicide of hayden the painter although the collapse of the railway mania really began in eighteen forty five its effects were not fully felt until the commencement of this year when ten per cent on railway capital had to be lodged with the accountant-general within seven days from the assembling of parliament which in this case meant the twenty ninth january 
It really received its first serious wound when the Bank of England rose its rate of discount on 16 October, but it was only when the calls had to be paid that it was found how rotten the whole concern was, as the Marquis of Clanricard in a speech plainly exposed. Said he, one of the names to the deed to which he was anxious to direct their attention was that of a gentleman said to reside in Finsbury Square, who had subscribed to the amount of twenty-five thousand pounds he was informed no such person was known at that address there was also in the contract deed the name of an individual who had figured in the dublin and galway railway case who was down for five thousand pounds and who was understood to be a half-pay officer in the receipt of fifty four pounds a year but who appeared as a subscriber in different railway schemes to the amount of forty one thousand five hundred pounds the address of another whose name was down for twelve thousand two hundred pounds was stated to be in watling street but it appeared he did not reside there in the case of another individual down for twelve thousand five hundred pounds a false address was found to have been given another individual whom he would not name was a curate in the parish in kent he might be worth all the money for which he appeared responsible in various railway schemes but his name appeared for twenty five thousand pounds in different projects and stood for ten thousand pounds in this line another individual who was down for twenty five thousand pounds was represented to be in poor circumstances a clerk in a public company was down for upwards of fifty thousand pounds there were several more cases of the same kind but he trusted he had stated enough to establish the necessity of referring the matter to a committee there were also two brothers sons of a charwoman living in a garret one of whom had signed for twelve thousand five hundred pounds and the other for twenty five thousand pounds these two brothers excellent persons no doubt but who were receiving about a guinea and a half between them were down for thirty seven thousand pounds the story of the collapse is so admirably told by mr francis that i prefer giving his version than writing of it myself money was scarce the price of stock and scrip lowered the confidence of the people was shaken and a vision of a dark future on every face advertisements were suddenly withdrawn from the papers men of note were seen no more as provisional committeemen distrust followed the merchant to the mart and the jobber to the exchange the new schemes ceased to be regarded applications ceased to be forwarded premiums were either lowered or ceased to exist bankers looked anxiously to the accounts of their customers bill brokers scrutinized their securities and every man was suspicious of his neighbour but this distrust was not confined to projected lines established railways felt the shock and were reduced in value consoles fell one and a half per cent exchequer bills declined in price and other markets sympathized the people had awoke from their dream and trembled it was a national alarm words are weak to express the fears and feelings which prevailed there was no village too remote to escape the shock and there was probably no house in town some occupant of which did not shrink from the morrow the statesman started to find his new bank charter so sadly and so suddenly tried the peer who had so thoughtlessly invested saw ruin opening to his view men hurried with bated breath to their brokers the allottee was uneasy and suspicious the provisional committeeman grew pale at his fearful responsibility directors ceased to boast their blushing honours and promoters saw their expected profits evaporate shares which the previous week were a fortune were the next a fatality to their owners the reputed shareholders were not found when they were wanted provisional committeemen were not more easy of access one railway advertised the names and addresses of thirty none of whom were to be heard of at the residences ascribed to them letters were returned to the post office day after day nor is this to be wondered at when it is said that on one projected line only sixty pounds was received for deposits which should have yielded seven hundred thousand pounds 
it was proved in the committee of the house of commons that one subscription list was formed of lame ducks of the alley and that in another several of the directors including the chairman had also altered their several subscriptions to the amount of a hundred thousand pounds the very evening on which the list was deposited and that five shillings a man was given to any one who would sign for a certain number of shares nothing more decidedly marked the crisis which had arrived than the fact that every one hastened to disown railways gentlemen who had been buried in prospectuses whose names and descriptions had been published under every variation that could fascinate the public who had figured as committee men and received the precious guineas for their attendance were eager to assure the world that they were ignorant of this great transgression men who a month before had boasted of the large sums they had made by scrip sent advertisements to papers denying their responsibility or appealed to the lord mayor to protect their characters members of parliament who had remained quiet under the infliction while it was somewhat respectable fell back upon their privileges when they saw their purses in danger there is no doubt that an unauthorized use of names was one feature of fraudulent companies and that amidst a list of common names it was thought a distinguished one might pass unnoticed the complaints therefore of those who were thus unceremoniously treated were just but the great mass of denials emanated from persons who knowingly encountered the risk and meanly shrunk from the danger it is the conviction of those who were best informed that no other panic was ever so fatal to the middle class it reached every hearth it saddened every heart in the metropolis entire families were ruined there was scarcely an important town in england but what beheld some wretched suicide daughters delicately nurtured went out to seek their bread sons were recalled from academies households were separated homes were desecrated by the emissaries of the law there was a disruption of every social tie the debtors' jails were peopled with promoters, Whitecross Street was filled with speculators, and the Queen's Bench was full to overflowing. Men who had lived comfortably and independently found themselves suddenly responsible for sums they had no means of paying. In some cases they yielded their all and began the world anew. In others they left the country for the continent, laughed at their creditors, and defied pursuit one gentleman was served with four hundred writs a peer when similarly pressed when offered to be relieved from all liabilities for fifteen thousand pounds betook himself to his yacht and forgot in the beauties of the mediterranean the difficulties which had surrounded him another gentleman who having nothing to lose surrendered himself to his creditors was a director of more than twenty lines a third was provisional committeeman to fifteen a fourth who commenced life as a printer who became insolvent in eighteen thirty two and a bankrupt in eighteen thirty seven who had negotiated partnerships who had arranged embarrassed affairs who had collected debts and turned his attention to anything did not disdain also to be a railway promoter a railway director or to spell his name in a dozen different ways the sheriff's officers had a busy time of it and punch in going out arresting gives the following colloquy between two of the fraternity now aaron my dear have you had any sport pretty well i've bagged four lotties and two provisionals but a notice of the railway mania would be very incomplete without a mention of george hudson the railway king he was born at Howsham, a village near York, in March 1800, was apprenticed to a draper in York, and subsequently became principal in the business, thus early in life becoming well off, besides having £30,000 left him by a distant relative. In 1837 he was Lord Mayor of York, and the same year was made Chairman of the York and North Midland Railway, which was opened in 1839 in eighteen forty one he was elected chairman of the great north of england company and afterwards held the same position in the midland railway company 
he speculated largely in railways and in the parliamentary return already alluded to his subscriptions appear as three hundred and nineteen thousand eight hundred and thirty five pounds he came to london and inhabited the house at albert gate knightsbridge now the french embassy where he entertained the prince consort and the aristocracy generally he was elected m p for sunderland in august eighteen forty five and again served as lord mayor of york in eighteen forty six the railway smash came and year by year things went worse with him until early in the year eighteen forty nine he had to resign the chairmanship of the eastern central now great eastern midland york newcastle and berwick and the york and north midland railway companies he went abroad where he lived for some time and tried unavailingly to retrieve his fortune in july eighteen sixty five he was committed to york castle for contempt of the court of exchequer in not paying a large debt and was there incarcerated till the following october he fell so low that in eighteen sixty eight some friends took pity on him and raised a subscription for him thus obtaining four thousand eight hundred pounds with which an annuity was purchased he died in london fourteen december eighteen seventy one we have been so accustomed to have nigger minstrels with us that i suppose very few of us know when they began of course i do not mean the solitary minstrel like rice of jump jim crow fame who was the first coming over here in eighteen thirty six but the first troop i find it in the illustrated news of twenty four january eighteen forty six whence also comes this illustration a party of american minstrels under the above designation commenced on wednesday night twenty one january at the hanover square rooms a series of concerts for the avowed purpose of affording an accurate notion of negro character and melody these artists are remarkably clever and admirably made up they are painted jet black with ruddy lips and large mouths and being capital actors the deception created is so great that wagers have been offered that they are really darkies they dress in dandy costumes a la julienne that is white waistcoated and wrist banded turned up in the most approved d'orsay fashion of course it is impossible to come to any right conclusion as to the authenticity of the african airs especially as they have arranged the compositions of the great european masters in such a grotesque manner the executants are five in number one plays the tambourine mr germon who is the leader another the bone castanet the third the accordion and the two others the banjo or african guitar the castanet player does not sing but his four colleagues have good voices and in glees harmonize charmingly in a quartet the parody on the phantom chorus from bellini's somnambula and in a glee you'll see them on the ohio nothing can be more effective than the skilful blending of the parts it is perhaps the buffo exhibition which will create the greatest sensation and in this quality they are inimitable the tambourine performer affects a ludicrous air of pompous sentiment while the castanet sable hero indulges in all kinds of buffoonery and antics he is a wonderful player no spaniard can rival him in rapidity delicacy and precision a scene called a railway overture causes an explosion of laughter they seem to be endowed with perpetual motion and the scream of the whistle at the same time as the noise of the engine beggars all description the entertainment is quite a novelty and will no doubt be attractive they have been provided with letters of recommendation from president polk and some leading persons in america who must be better able to appreciate the accuracy of their african delineations than europeans they were popular with a vengeance for every little street arab had beef bones for castanets and every new song was roared out in the streets until it nauseated punch drew policemen and dustmen as ethiopian serenaders and even suggested that la blache mario and tamburini should adopt the style 
The Queen opened Parliament on 19 January, and in her speech, whilst deprecating the very frequent instances in which the crime of deliberate assassination has been of late committed in Ireland, she went on, I have to lament that, in consequence of a failure of the potato crop in several parts of the United Kingdom, there will be a deficient supply of an article of food which forms the chief subsistence of great numbers of my people. The disease by which the plant has been affected has prevailed to the utmost extent in Ireland. I have adopted all such precautions as it was in my power to adopt, for the purpose of alleviating the sufferings which may be caused by this calamity and i shall confidently rely on your cooperation in devising such other means for effecting the same benevolent purpose as may require the sanction of the legislature on thirteen march parliament talked somewhat about the matter and sir james graham the home secretary confessed that distress pervades the whole of ireland it is to be found in every province in every county in every union nay almost in every parish in ireland the course her majesty's government has taken has been this we have in particular parts of ireland established depots where food can be bought at an easy price at the very lowest price and thinking that eleomisonary relief ought to be avoided as much as possible we propose to afford to the utmost possible extent either by means of public works to be undertaken or by works already established the means by which the people may be enabled to earn wages and so to purchase food at the moderate cost at which it will be supplied but in spite of all the government could do with the very best intentions gaunt famine was stalking through the land and the hungry folk could not be quiet with the sight of food before them they were not going to starve when they saw the baker's shops full of bread and the butchers of meat human nature and a hungry belly could not stand it so we can scarcely wonder at the famine riots which ensued the shops were wrecked the food was taken they even laid their hands on a boat proceeding from limerick to clare with relief and plundered it of its cargo of corn and maize flour but alas this was only the commencement of the sad story there was an alternative open to those who had the money to emigrate and this they did see the following from the cork reporter copied into the times of eighteen april for the past fortnight our keys have been daily thronged with the fine and stalwart peasantry of this and the adjoining counties preparing to emigrate to various parts of the transatlantic world perhaps upon no former occasion even before the hope of railway employment was held out to the people and when government grants for their relief were never heard of did the number of emigrants from this quarter exceed the proportion of this present year besides the various large and well-freighted vessels which have left the keys of cork direct for america several ships were dispatched to the west of the country and had no difficulty in obtaining their full complement of passengers two large ships went round to bearhaven a few days ago and have since left the shores of that bleak district with over two hundred passengers several other vessels have proceeded or are about to proceed for baltimore and bearhaven localities in which the destitution of the present year has been severely felt three hundred persons have been ready for the last fortnight to embark from dingle but not being able to get a ship to visit them sufficiently commodious for their accommodation have been obliged to make the best of their way to cork several vessels now lying at passage will sail this day these taking five hundred and fifty passengers at a moderate computation about nine thousand immigrants have or within the next month will have left this port for america it is to be hoped their anticipations will be realized there can be little fear however that their condition could be worse or their prospects more disheartening than those which the potato famine in this country little mended by the promise of indian corn had occasioned la fin chasse la lou or du bois to starve or emigrate are the only alternatives of the people the waterford chronicle thus comments there will have gone after the season is over upwards of three thousand people from this country by this port alone 
not to talk of the rearing of these people the trouble and expense of bringing up a healthy man woman or child and especially leaving out the irreparable loss to society in this country of their affections hopes and family ties all now sundered and destroyed not to talk of the countless living deaths of wholesale immigration from a feeling and warm-hearted mother country the amount of capital taken by these three thousand is immense assuming that each individual spends ten pounds in his passage and before he settles and that he has ten pounds more to establish himself here is a direct taking away in hard cash of sixty thousand pounds gone out of the bleeding pores of ireland to increase the misery which is left behind we are in possession of facts which show that many cunning landlords are sending away their people yearly but by degrees and not in such a manner as to subject themselves to a clearance notice if this system be continued we shall be tempted to give names after these things who will blame the people for outbreaks occasioned by famine there is nothing plentiful in the land but ruin employment is scarce money is scarce the people are being thinned farms are being consolidated bullock land is progressing ill fares the land to hastening ills of prey where cows accumulate and men decay for some long time there had been a conflict of opinion as to the merits of different sized gauges for railways brunel the magnificent advocated a width of seven feet and practised it on the great western others wished for something far more modest great was the wrangling over this battle of the gauges and a royal commission was appointed to inquire into the matter they gave in their report on thirty may and the question was settled by an act for regulating the gauge of railways nine and ten vic c fifty seven passed eighteen august eighteen forty six by which it was settled that in future all railway lines in england were to be four feet eight and a half inches wide and in ireland the width was to be five feet three inches by the way railway surveyors were paid well and almost every one that had ever dragged a chain posed as a surveyor as a sample on twenty three april is reported the case of white v co and mon where a witness said levellers are always well paid i have received before this ten pounds a mile and i could level from seven to eight miles a day these are not extraordinary terms i had to find hands to help me i had three men at seven shillings a day each on twenty two june poor hayden the painter committed suicide he was extremely egotistical and nothing could persuade him that he was not the best painter of his time his fixed idea was that he was without a peer but no one else thought so his diary is very sad reading here is an entry april thirteenth relative to the exhibition of his picture the banishment of aristides receipts of one pound three shillings sixpence an advertisement of a finer description could not have been written to catch the public but not a shilling more was added to the receipts they rush by thousands to see tom thumb they push they fight they scream they faint they cry help and murder they see my bills and caravans but do not read them their eyes are on them but their sense is gone it is an insanity a rabies furor a dream of which i would not have believed englishmen could have been guilty he even wrote to the times about it general tom thumb last week received twelve thousand people who paid him six hundred pounds b r hayden who has devoted forty-two years to elevate their taste was honoured by the visits of a hundred and thirty-three and a half producing five pounds thirteen shillings sixpence being a reward for painting two of his finest works aristides and nero horace vernet la roche Ingray, cornelius hess snore and scheffer hasten to this glorious country of fresco and patronage and grand design if you have a tender fancy to end your days in a whig union end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of gossip in the first decade of victoria's reign by john ashton 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 The Last Post Office Bellman The Corn Law Act Sir Walter Scott's Monument The Irish Famine The Duke of Wellington's Statue Guncotton Introduction of Ether Model Dwelling Houses Baths and Wash Houses Smithfield Cattle Market The Bullfight of Smithfield the first submarine telegraph the illustrated london news of twenty seven june gives us the letter carrier's last knell we have just lost another of what poor thomas hood called those evening bells the postmaster-general having issued his fiat for the abolition of ringing bells by the letter carriers the last knell was rung out on the evening of wednesday last and as a memorial of the departure of what appeared to most persons a very useful practice our artist has sketched a letter carrier on his last evening call at our office and another hand has appended the following lament the dustman was first to forgo his brass clapper the muffin boy speedily followed his shade and now tis the postman that double-tongued rapper must give up his bell for the eve's promenade tante animis sage legislators why rage against trifles like these prithee tell why leave the solution to rude commentators who say that at home you've enough in one bell on twenty sixth june the royal assent was given to an act nine ten vic c twenty two called an act to amend the laws relating to the importation of corn this regulated the duty on corn by a sliding scale of prices which was to be in force until one february eighteen forty nine when it was fixed at one shilling per quarter the passing of this act caused general rejoicing throughout the country and put an end to a great deal of political rancour the inauguration of sir walter scott's monument at edinburgh took place on fifteen august the anniversary of his birth it was erected in eighteen forty forty four after designs by mr george m kemp at a cost of fifteen thousand six hundred and fifty pounds it is cruciform with a gothic spire chiefly modelled on the details of melrose abbey and includes beneath its basement arches a carrara marble sitting statue of scott with his dog maida by his side which is the work of mr steele and cost two thousand pounds the potato crop utterly failed again in ireland and the outlook there was indeed black in the times of two september its correspondent writing from dublin on thirty one august says as it is now an admitted fact on all sides that the destruction of the early potato crop is complete there can be no earthly use in loading your columns with repetitions of the sad details as furnished day after day in the accounts published by the irish newspapers it will therefore nearly suffice to say that according to the reports from all quarters the crisis of deep and general distress cannot be much longer averted and that it will require all the energies of both government and landlords to mitigate the inevitable consequences of a calamity of which both parties have been duly forewarned in the meantime the following statement in a limerick paper of saturday is another curious illustration of the irish difficulty in the corn market this day there appeared about four thousand bushels of oats and about an equal quantity of wheat all this grain was purchased up principally for exportation whilst the food of the people as exhibited this day in the potato market was a mass of disease and rottenness this is an anomaly which no intricacies of political economy no legal quibbles or crotchets no government arrangements can reconcile in an agricultural country which produces the finest corn for the food of man we have to record that the corn is sold and sent out of the country whilst the individuals that raised it by their toil and labour are threatened with all the horrors of starvation from a multiplicity of concurrent statements respecting the pestilence i shall merely subjoin one which appears in the last trolley paper a man would hardly dig in a day as much sound potatoes as himself could consume but that is not the worst of it 
common cholera has set in among the people of the town owing to the use of potatoes which contain a large quantity of poisonous matter a professional gentleman in this town of considerable experience and unquestioned integrity assures me that he has attended within the last fortnight in this town and neighbourhood more than twelve cases of common cholera and that he would think a person as safe in consuming a certain quantity of arsenic as in using the potatoes now exposed for sale this is how the famine of eighteen forty six seven began and what followed is a matter of history which every one ought to know and ponder well over but it can hardly come under the name of gossip there were naturally a few food riots in different parts of the country but every one tried to do their best even in a blundering way to alleviate the distress the archbishop of canterbury composed a special form of prayer to be used on sunday eleven october on twenty nine september the gigantic equestrian statue of the duke of wellington which used to crown the arch opposite apsley house and which was taken down twenty four january eighteen eighty three and then set up at aldershot was moved from the artist's wyatt studio in harrow road to hyde park it was twenty seven feet high and weighed about forty tons being made of brass guns taken by the duke in various victories being of so great a weight the appliances to remove it were on an equally massive scale the carriage and framework in which it was placed weighing about twenty tons it took one hundred soldiers to haul the statue out of the studio and when mounted on its carriage it took twenty-nine huge dray horses lent by mr godding of the lion brewery waterloo to drag it to its destination it was escorted by soldiers and military bands and did the distance in about an hour and a half the next day was spent in preparing to hoist it the day after it was lifted some fifty feet and there remained all night and the next day was safely landed and put in position from that time until it was taken down it was the butt of scoffs and jeers and no one regretted its departure gun cotton was brought into public notice by some experiments by its inventor professor schoenbein of basel before the chairman of the east india company and a number of scientists professor brand had previously lectured upon it at the royal institution on fifteen january when he stated that about fifteen years before branconet had ascertained that sawdust wood shavings starch linen and cotton fabrics when treated with concentrated nitric acid produced a gelatinous substance which coagulated into a white mass on the addition of water this substance which he called xylodyne was highly inflammable schoenbein however made his explosive from purified cotton steeped in a mixture of equal parts of nitric and sulphuric acids which when carefully washed and dried kept its appearance of cotton wool in the times of four november is a notice of gun sawdust a powder now much used made by mr george turner of leeds whilst on the subject of chemicals i may as well mention what was much talked of at the time the discovery of sulphuric ether when inhaled being an anaesthetic previous to this nitrous oxide or as it was called laughing gas somewhat inadequately performed the same function this latter was discovered by dr priestley in seventeen seventy six and its use as an anaesthetic recommended by sir humphrey davy in eighteen eighty was put into practice by mr wells in america to lessen the pain in extracting teeth in eighteen forty four the first notice of the inhalation of sulphuric ether that i know of is in number forty five of the british and foreign medical review which says just as our last proof was passing through our hands we received from our medical friends in boston the account of a matter so interesting to surgeons and indeed to every one that we take the opportunity of introducing it here we know nothing more of this new method of eschewing pain than what is contained in the following extracts from two private letters kindly written to us by our excellent friends dr ware and dr warren of boston both men of the highest eminence in their profession in america and we may truly say in europe also 
it is impossible however not to regard the discovery as one of the very highest importance not in the practice of operative surgery only but also as dr ware suggests in practical medicine we trust our friends will forgive us for putting into print their private communications the importance of the subject and the necessity of authenticating the statements are our excuses the authors of the discovery are dr c t jackson and dr morton dr warren writes under date of twenty four november that in six cases i have had it applied with satisfactory success and no unpleasant sequel and dr ware twenty nine november says it was brought into use by a dentist and is now chiefly employed by that class of practitioners he has taken out a patent for the discovery and has dispatched persons to europe to secure one there also so you will soon hear of it and probably have an opportunity of witnessing its effects then follows a long list of operations performed in america wound up with this postscript december twenty second yesterday we had ourselves this new mode of cheating pain put in practice by a master of surgery on our own side of the atlantic in the theatre of university college hospital mr liston amputated the thigh of a man previously narcotized by the inhalation of ether vapour shortly after being placed on the operating table the patient began to inhale and became apparently insensible in the course of two or three minutes the operation was then commenced and the limb was removed in what seemed to us a marvellously short time certainly less than a minute the patient remaining during the incisions and the tying of the arteries perfectly still and motionless while the vessels were being secured on being spoken to he roused up partially still showing no signs of pain and answered questions put to him in a slow drowsy manner he declared to us that at no part of the operation had he felt pain though he seemed to be partially conscious he had heard some words and felt that something was being done to his limb he was not aware till told that the limb was off and when he knew it expressed great gratification at having been saved from pain the man seemed quite awake when removed from the operating room and continued so everything has since proceeded as usual and very favourably mr liston afterwards performed one of the minor but most painful operations of surgery the partial removal of the nail in onychia on a man similarly narcotized and with precisely the same result the patient seemed to feel no pain and upon rousing up after the operation declared that he had felt none punch found another and more domestic use for this anaesthetic patient this is really most delightful a most beautiful dream not only was there advance in medicine but also in social science people began to think that the condition of the working classes might be ameliorated by giving them better dwellings as yet little or nothing had been done in this way in london but a grand opportunity occurred at liverpool in the building of birkenhead and an extensive range of model dwellings were erected four-storied with ornate exterior the rents varying from three shillings to five shillings per set of rooms according to position but this included a constant supply of water and the use of one gas burner in each set of rooms and all rates and taxes with moreover two iron bedsteads a grate with an oven and convenient fixtures and they were found to answer financially the queen's consent was given on twenty sixth august to an act to encourage the establishment of public baths and wash houses nine ten vic c seventy four how it was appreciated by the animals called vestrymen may be seen by the fact that at a vestry meeting of the inhabitants of st leonard's shoreditch held twenty sixth october the subject was brought forward when an amendment was moved that it be taken into consideration that day six months for the amendment twenty eight against twenty the dangers of smithfield market were becoming too apparent as we see by a letter in the times of twenty sixth november sir your paper of this morning again gives an account of more accidents arising in consequence of cattle being driven along our crowded streets and we may expect to hear of numerous 
probably some fatal injuries being sustained during the short and often very dark days which are common for some months in the winter every one whose avocations call him into the city has to complain of the delay arising from the overcrowded state of the leading thoroughfares and on smithfield market days the obstruction is greatly increased by the droves of cattle and sheep which in a bewildered and frequently infuriated state are being forced by crowds of men boys and dogs along the streets to the great annoyance and often danger of the passengers i do not here dwell on the revolting scenes of cruelty to the animals which every one has to witness and deplore but on the ground of danger to human life and also because of the seriously increased obstruction to the general traffic which is caused by having the cattle market in the heart of the metropolis i would urge the removal of smithfield market to some more appropriate place when this has been effected when abattoirs have been constructed where alone all the larger animals are permitted to be slaughtered and when cattle are allowed to be driven through the streets only at hours before the business of the day has commenced then and not before will london be in reference to its cattle market and slaughterhouses what is required in the middle of the nineteenth century punch gives us the following lyric on the subject the bullfight of smithfield there's trampling feet in goswell street there's row on holborn hill there's crush and crowd and swearing loud from bass to treble shrill from grazier cad and drover lad and butcher shining greasy and slaughter men and knackers men and policemen free and easy tis monday morn and onward borne to smithfield's mart repair the pigs and sheep and lowing deep the oxen fine and fair they're trooping on from islington and down whitechapel road to wild halloo of a shouting crew and yelp and bite and goad from combs of distant devonshire from sunny sussex wold from where their durham pastures the stately shorthorns hold from herefordshire marches from fenny cambridge flat for london's maw they gathered these oxen fair and fat the stunted stalks of cambria's rocks uneasily are lowing with redder blaze of wild amaze their eyes around them throwing and the unkempt stut of galloway and the kylo of the murns whose hoof that crushed the heather tuft the mild macadam spurns they may talk of plaza mayor of Tarero's nimble feet of montez the famed matador of picadors so fleet but what is spanish bullfight to deeds which we can show when through the street at all they meet the smithfield oxen go see there see there where high in the air the nurse and nursling fly into a first-floor window see where the old gent they shy now they're bolting into parlours now they're tumbling into cellars to the great disgust and terror of the peaceable indwellers who rides so neat down chisel street a city knight i ween by girth and span an alderman nor less by port and mean look out look out that sudden shout the smithfield herd is nigh now turn sir knight and boldly fight or more discreetly fly he hath eased round on his saddle all fidgety and fast there's another herd behind him and the time for flight is past full in his front glares a rabid runt through tears of pain that blind him for the drovers almost twisted off the tail that hangs behind him all lightly armed for such a shock was stout sir callipee but he couched his new umbrella and police aloud cried he crash smash slap dash the whalebone snaps the saddle seat is bare and the knight in mazy circles is flying through the air the runt tears on the rout is gone the street is calm once more and to bartlemy's they bear him extended on a door now gramercy good sir callipy to the turtle and the haunch that padded out thy civic ribs and lined thy stately paunch no ribs are broke but a shattering stroke thy system has sustained any other than an alderman had certainly been brained and soon as he had breath to swear the knight right roundly swore that straight he'd put down smithfield and set up an abattoir 
In this year there were sold at Smithfield 226,132 beasts, 1,593,270 sheep and lambs, 26,356 calves, and 33,531 pigs, to deal with which there were about 160 salesmen. Things went on very much in the same style, as described in Punch, until 1851, when the contracted space of the market, the slaughtering places adjoining, and many other nuisances gave grounds for general dissatisfaction, and after an investigation, an Act, 1415 Vic, C. 61, was passed on 1 August, for providing a metropolitan market and conveniences therewith in lieu of the cattle market at Smithfield. A suitable site was found in Copenhagen Fields, Islington. The last market at Smithfield was held on 11 June, and the first at the new one on 13 June, 1855. The Hampshire Guardian, copied into the Times of 12 December, gives us the story of the first submarine telegraph. We are enabled to supply the following additional particulars respecting the submarine telegraph laid down across our harbour. It is now about three years since the telegraph from the Nine Elms terminus to the terminus at Gosport was first established. Subsequently, from the inconvenience experienced at the Admiralty Office here, because of the distance to the telegraph station, the wires were continued from that place to the Royal Clarence Yard. With this addition, although the inconvenience was lessened, it was far from being removed, the harbour intervening, leaving a distance of upwards of a mile to the Admiral's house, unconnected and notwithstanding the wish of the authorities, both here and in London, that the telegraph should be carried to the dockyard, no attempt has hitherto been made to do so, because it has been considered almost impossible to convey it under water. An offer, indeed, was made to the Admiralty to lay down a telegraph enclosed in metallic pipes, which were to be fixed under the water by the aid of diving bells this scheme having been found to be impractical has been very prudently abandoned whatever difficulties may have hitherto interfered to prevent the establishment of submarine telegraphs appear now to have been entirely overcome for the time occupied from the commencement of carrying the telegraph from shore to shore and transmitting signals did not occupy a quarter of an hour the telegraph which has the appearance of an ordinary rope was coiled into one of the dockyard boats one end of it being made fast on shore and as the boat was pulled across the telegraphic rope was gradually paid out over the stern its superior gravity causing it to sink to the bottom immediately independently of the simplicity of this submarine telegraph it has an advantage which even the telegraphs on land do not possess in the event of an accident it can be replaced in ten minutes the success of the trial here has we understand determined the inventors to lay down their contemplated line across the channel from england to france under the sanction of the respective governments such was the germ of the multitudinous cables which now span every ocean End of chapter twenty eight Chapter twenty nine of A Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty nine Medals for Army and Navy, Grenville Library, Day of Fasting, Binding of Satan, Suspension of Transportation, New House of Lords, Jenny Lind, Bunn versus Lind, Jenny Linden, Death of O'Connell, Story of the Duke of Buckley abolition of eton montem at this time at all events we did not plaster our soldiers with medals for every trifling deed of duty and it was not until january of this year that a commission was appointed to decide upon the medals which were to be presented to the officers and men who served in the peninsula under wellington and other commanders and it was not till the first of june that an order was issued from the horse guards that claims might be sent in by those who were present in battles from seventeen ninety three to eighteen fourteen or rather the list began with maida eighteen o six and ended with toulouse eighteen fourteen 
The medals for naval service began with the glorious 1st of June, 1794, and ended with the fight between the Endymion and President on 25 January, 1815. The medal for Waterloo was granted some long time afterwards. In January, the British Museum received the splendid bequest of the Library of Thomas Grenville, Esquire, who died 17 December, 1846. This magnificent library of over 20,000 volumes, valued at the very low estimate of 50,000 pounds, contains two copies of the Mazarin Bible, one on vellum, a first folio of Shakespeare, Caxton's Reynard the Fox, and countless other literary treasures and rarities. He had intended to leave this library to the Duke of Buckingham, but reflecting that as most of the books had been paid for with the proceeds of a sinecure office, Chief Justice in Ayr, south of the Trent, of £2,000 a year, which he had held from 1800 to 1817, when it was abolished, he felt it only just that they should be given to the nation, who had virtually paid for them. With them came as curator his valet, Mr. Holden, who remained with his master's beloved books until three or four years since. On 9 March, a royal proclamation was issued for a day of fasting and humiliation on account of the famine and distress in Ireland, and it was duly kept on the day set apart for it, 24 March. There is a curious paragraph in the Times of 23 March. Binding of Satan during the past two or three weeks a number of persons have been going round the streets on the surrey side of the water wearing belts like those worn by the fire brigade on which passages from the scriptures are painted carrying with them an inkhorn and long sheets of paper soliciting signatures to what they pretend to be a petition to heaven for the binding of satan the prince of darkness so eager are those persons to get the paper signed that men, women, and children are stopped indiscriminately and requested to sign. Those who are too young to sign, or unable to write their names, have the same done for them by the men who do not attempt to disguise the fact of belonging to the followers of Joanna Southcote. Upon several occasions a great deal of confusion has been created by the parties, for they generally manage to go about with knots of forty or fifty persons, and occasionally discussions ensue which are calculated to bring the scriptures into perfect ridicule one person more intelligent than the persons who are hawking the petitions about inquired who it is that will present the petition when the man replied with the greatest coolness that as soon as a sufficient number of names are attached to the petition it will be presented to the throne of mercy by joanna sothcote herself surely it is high time that such exhibitions were put down by the police early in april a circular from the home secretary was forwarded to the magistrates of the various jails telling them that in consequence of the suspension of transportation of male convicts to van diemen's land it would be requisite for them to make immediate provision for the confinement and employment in this country of a great number of such offenders on the fourteenth of april the queen paid a visit of inspection to the new house of lords and on the next day the peers took possession of it and transacted business there for the first time talk of gossip was there ever such food for it as the arrival of jenny lind it was a furor a madness she arrived in london late on the afternoon of april seventeen and was present in the evening at the performance at her majesty's theatre on May 4 she made her first appearance on the stage in England in this theatre, where she played in Robert le Diable, and from that moment until the end of the season nothing else was thought of, nothing else talked of, but Jenny Lind, and it was no short-lived fit of enthusiasm, for she was the favourite of the public until her retirement. Her beautiful voice and simplicity of manner, charming every one, from royalty downwards. Unfortunately, her debut was somewhat marred by a pecuniary squabble between her and Bunn, the operatic poet, a rival impresario, Lumley, having secured her services. Here is Punch's version of the squabble. Jenny Lenden, a dreadful engagement between the Swedish nightingale and the poet Bunn. 
on lind when drury's sun was low and bootless was the wild beast show the lessee counted for a flow of rhino to the treasury but jenny lind whose wakened sight saw drury in a proper light refused for any sum per night to sing at the menagerie with rage and ire in vain displayed each super drew his wooden blade in fury half and half afraid for his prospective salary bun in a flaming frenzy flew and speedily the goose quill drew with which he was accustomed to pen such a deal of poetry he wrote the maiden to remind her of a compact she had signed to drury lane's condition blind and threatened law accordingly fair as in face in nature she implored the man to set her free assuring him that he would be remunerated handsomely two thousand pounds she offered so that he would only let her go bun who would have his bond said no with dogged pertinacity and now his action let him bring and try how much the law will wring from her to do the handsome thing who had proposed so readily the swedish nightingale to cage he failed she sought a fitting stage and left him to digest his rage and seek his legal remedy then shook the house with plaudits riven when jenny's opening note was given the sweetest songstress under heaven forth bursting into melody but fainter the applause shall grow as waning drury's wild beast show and feebler still shall be the flow of rhino to the treasury footnote the case of bun v lind came on in the court of queen's bench on twenty two february eighteen forty eight damages laid at ten thousand pounds the jury found a verdict for the plaintiff and the case was ultimately settled for a payment of two thousand pounds End note. the opera triumphs lumley brave thy bacon thou shalt more than save wave london all thy kerchiefs wave and cheer with all thy chivalry tis night and still yon star doth run but all in vain for treasure done and mr hughes the poet bun and quadrupeds and company for sweden's nightingale so sweet their fellowship had been unmeet the sawdust beneath whose feet hath been the drama's sepulchre died on fifteenth may at genoa on his route to rome aged seventy two daniel o'connell the erst uncrowned king of ireland who during his lifetime had been a thorn and a very troublesome one in the side of every english government his heart was forwarded to rome but his body was embalmed and in due time was sent to ireland for internment the Liverpool Albion, quoted in the Times of 14th May, is responsible for the following story. Some time ago the Duke of Buckley, in one of his walks, purchased a cow from a person in the neighbourhood of Dalcleath, and left orders to send it to his palace on the following morning. According to agreement, the cow was sent, and the Duke, who happened to be en déshabille, and walking in the avenue espied a little fellow ineffectually attempting to drive the animal to its destination the boy not knowing the duke bawled out to him hi mon come here and guess a ham with this beast the duke saw the mistake and determined to have a joke with the little fellow pretending therefore not to understand him the duke walked on slowly the boy still craving his assistance at last he cried in a tone of apparent distress come here mon and help us and sure as anything i'll give you half i get this last solicitation had the desired effect the duke went and lent a helping hand and now said the duke as they trudged along how much do you think you will get for this job ah oh, dinna ken said the boy but i am sure of something for the folk up at the house are good to all bodies as they approached the house the duke darted from the boy and entered by a different way he called a servant and put a sovereign into his hand, saying, Give that to the boy that has brought the cow. The duke returned to the avenue and was soon rejoined by the boy. Well, now, how much did you get? said the duke. A shilling, said the boy, and there's the half of it to ye. But surely you got more than a shilling, said the duke. No, said the boy, with the utmost earnestness. As sure as death, that's all I got, and do you think it's a plenty? 
i do not said the duke there must be some mistake and as i am acquainted with the duke if you return i think i'll get you more the boy consented back they went the duke rang the bell and ordered all the servants to be assembled now said the duke to the boy point out the person who gave you the shilling it was that chap there with the apron pointing to the butler the delinquent confessed fell on his knees and attempted an apology but the duke interrupted him indignantly ordering him to give the boy the sovereign and quit his service instantly you have lost said the duke your money your situation and your character by your covetousness learn henceforth that honesty is the best policy the boy by this time recognized his assistant in the person of the duke and the duke was so delighted with the sterling worth and honesty of the boy that he ordered him to be sent to school kept there and provided for at his own expense eton montem was abolished this year it was a triennial custom and had for its purpose the presentation of a sum of money to the captain of the school on his departure to the university every third year on whitsun tuesday some of the eton boys clad in fancy costume as is here given from the montem of eighteen forty four went to salt hill and the neighbourhood generally and levied contributions or salt from all passers-by the custom led to grave abuses and the provost and headmaster determined that it should end but that the boy who benefited by it should not be a loser the latter dr hartray gave him two hundred pounds out of his own pocket the following is an account of the death and burial of eton montem tuesday twenty five may this being the day on which the triennial festival of montem would have been celebrated at eton and salt hill had it not been abolished by the provost and the authorities of eton considerable excitement prevailed in the vicinity of the college from an early hour this morning in consequence from rumours which had been in circulation for some time past of its being apprehended that some demonstration would be made by the boys assisted by several old etonians from oxford and cambridge who are strongly opposed to the abolition of the ceremony which might lead to a breach of the peace with the exception of about a thousand small squares of glass being demolished in the vicinity of the lower school and similar breakages but to a much smaller extent at the houses of parties who were supposed to be in favour of the determination which had been come to by the provost we have heard of no demonstration of a riotous character on the part of the boys this being a whole holiday several of the head boys had permission to proceed in boats up the thames for the day as far as clefton between one hundred and two hundred have also left for the whitsun holidays thus thinning the number remaining at college to a considerable extent as soon as absence had been called by the headmaster the rev dr hawtrey shortly after twelve o'clock the boys numbering between two hundred and three hundred formed in procession in the playing fields and marched across the fields preceded by a black flag to the celebrated mont at salt hill they were joined by a great many of the old etonians from the universities of oxford and cambridge who arrived at eton this morning each wore on his left arm a band and rosette of black crepe and many had white hat-bands and scarves as they were seen wending their way towards salt hill they had all the appearance of mourners merry though they might be in a funeral procession upon their arrival at the mount the black flag was waved in solemn silence and afterwards placed on the summit drooping on the ground typical of the lost glories of montem the large party then proceeded to bottoms at the windmill hotel whence after partaking of a luncheon they again returned to the mount and with the flag retraced their steps back to college a match at cricket was played during the day between the oxonians and the present etonians in the shooting fields attached to the college a splendid cold collation was provided in the evening for the players by mr clark of the christopher inn the waiters who attended upon the guests were compelled to wear black crepe upon their arms in keeping as it was observed with the solemnity of the occasion such were the fears entertained by some of the college authorities that a disturbance might take place in the course of the day 
that a strong body of the metropolitan a division of police was stationed at slough in plain clothes as we are informed to be in readiness to assist the local authorities in the event of their services being required it being expected that a mob composed of the idle and lazy of the two towns might in the course of the evening show some disposition to create a disturbance the abolition of montem is not only considered to be a most unpopular proceeding on the part of the old and present etonians but also by the tradesmen of eton and windsor amongst the former of whom a large sum of money was triennially circulated both before and during the festival punch has a lament on it of which i reproduce three verses say hill of salt for thou hast seen full many a noble race do what might be considered mean in any other case with cap in hand and courtly leg waylay the traveller and beg say was it not a pleasing sight those young etonians to behold for eleemosynary gold arrest the passing white whilst some of more excursive bent their vagrant arts to ply to all the various places went that in the neighbourhood lie to datchet slough or horton they or e'en to colnick took their way or ancient windsor's regal town stopped every body they could meet knocked at each house in every street in hopes of half a crown gay clothes were theirs by fancy made some were as romans dressed some in the grecian garb arrayed some bore the knightly crest theirs was attire of every hue of every fashion old or new various as nathan's ample store angelic beings ladies say will ye let these things pass away must montem be no more from this to the accession of the queen there is no more gossip to chronicle End of chapter 29 End of A Gossip in the First Decade of Victoria's Reign by John Ashton